Good morning. Welcome to the Senate Housing Committee. And to those of you who don't come here often, welcome to your capital. So we obviously have a very full agenda today, so let's get right to it. I'm going to open a public hearing on Senate Bill 608. And in just a moment, uh, my committee administrator, Cheyenne Ross, will give you a brief summary of the bill. But first, as you can see, we have a lot of interest. And so I want to give everyone an overview of the plan for today that will give us an opportunity to have a thorough hearing and also make sure that everyone who wants to be heard will be heard tonight. So first, I'm going to call up four panels of witnesses who will testify to the process that has put Senate Bill 608 before us, the technical aspects of the bill, and the research behind those policies. So as members of the committee, we may ask them questions about the process, the policies, and the bill itself. In other words, as members of the public here today, you don't need to worry about us peppering you with questions. We will save the questions for the panels of folks who have actually come prepared to answer those questions. And we want you to feel safe sharing your thoughts, your experiences, without fear of being peppered with questions from us. So I'm going to give them a few extra minutes to be able to do that, since they'll also be responding to questions. So given that we have about 200 people signed up to speak, some of whom may eventually not choose to speak, but that's about how many who have signed up. We're going to ask that everyone keep your comments to about a minute. We will have a timer set at about a minute 30, about a minute and a half. Um, but we do ask you to try and keep them to about a minute so that we can make sure that everybody is accommodated. Uh, if you do need a Spanish interpreter, we have made sure that one is available. And at the beginning of your testimony for the members of the public, all you need to do is state your name. That's the only thing that's required. You can also, if you'd like, state where you're from, but that is optional. And we're going to be calling two panels at a time. So for those of you who are in the overflow room, we have four chairs at the front here who are currently occupied by our first panel. Those are our on-deck chairs. So we'll be calling one panel up to the dais, and they'll be calling the whole next panel. So if you're either in this room or if you're in the overflow room, please make your way to these front four chairs so that we can minimize the transition time in between panels. And we're going to be aiming to end around 8 o'clock tonight. That is the goal. But again, the biggest goal on this very important policy affecting the entire state is to make sure that everyone who's made the trek to the Capitol today has an opportunity to be heard on this topic. So uh, the last thing is, just so you know, after you testify, you can always go on the Oregon Legislative Information System, or OLIS, and actually download your testimony if that's something that you want to keep for your own records. So with that, Ms. Ross, will you please summarize Senate Bill 608. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Senate Bill Senate, uh, 608 has no revenue impact and an indeterminate fiscal impact. It prohibits termination of month-to-month -month tenancies without cause after one year of occupancy. It requires fixed-term tenancies to convert to month-to-month -to -month after a year of occupancy unless a new fixed term is agreed on or the landlord has warned the tenant contemporaneously in writing of three separate violations of the agreement within the preceding 12 months as specified and provided 90 days written notice. Exempt zone occupied we tenancies. Still, we can't hear you. Maybe slower and louder. Madam Chair, members of the committee, the staff measure summary is also posted and publicly available on OLIS in case there's anything that you miss. And it will be explained and discussed by the panels that come up as well. Exempts owner-occupied tenancies no more than two dwellings in the same building or on the same property as a landlord's primary residence, allows landlords to terminate tenancies in order to demolish or repurpose the dwelling within a reasonable time, to renovate or repair premises that are or will be unsafe or unfit for occupancy within a reasonable time, or to occupy the premises as a primary residence for self or immediate family when no comparable unit is available at the same location at the same time, or when the landlord has notified the tenant within 120 days of accepting a buyer's offer to purchase the dwelling or primary residence, requires notice to specify reason, date, and supporting facts, requires landlord to pay tenant one month's rent unless there are four or fewer dwelling units, provides tenant defense against action for possession and three months rent plus actual damages for violations when tenant brings action within one year, limits residential rent increases within any 12-month period to no more than 7% above the change to the consumer price index, except when the dwelling has been certified for occupancy less than 15 years or when rent is reduced pursuant to a government assistance or subsidy program, provides for actual damages plus three months rent for violations, declares an emergency, is effective on passage. We also have a handful of amendments, five sets of amendments, submitted by Senator Girard, which I could also summarize. Or I believe that one of the witnesses is planning to do the summarizing, so we'll, we'll wait right. for that. 
So thank you very much. With that, I'm gonna call up the first panel, which is House Speaker Tina Kotek, Senate President Peter Courtney, and Senate Majority Leader Jenny Burdick. And the on-deck panel is Sybil Hebb and Katrina Holland. So if those folks could please come up to the on-deck circle. In fact, our in the hole, I guess if we're going with baseball terminology, panel is Jim Straub and Ron Garcia. And those folks could also make their way to the on-deck chairs as well. So with that, uh, please begin in whichever order you prefer. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, for the record, I'm Tina Kotek. I'm state representative from North and Northeast Portland and Speaker of the House. Thank you for the opportunity, Chair Fagan, members of the committee, to be here today in support of Senate Bill 608. I will be brief. There will be people here who can talk about the details of the bill. So I just want to speak high level of why we're here today. Senate Bill 608 is a necessary piece of legislation that will provide predictability and stability for our tenants in the state of Oregon. It will bring fairness to a system that is out of balance. And you'll see in my testimony, which has been submitted online, um, a lot more detail there about why we're doing this. But let me just share one thing. Leadership in this building have said, we want to make sure every student in, the, in this state has success um, in school. We have the highest number of, of number of homeless children in this country here in the state of Oregon. And if we want our students to be successful, they must have stable and predictable housing. So this isn't just a standalone bill to talk about housing. It's a bill that says we want to support our families and our students and everybody who needs stable, predictable, affordable housing. Now, I will also say this is not the only thing we need to do this session, and I will be the first one to say that Supply is also part of this conversation to, to face what is a very serious crisis, our housing crisis here in the state. But it would be dishonest on my part to say we only want to talk about supply. We need supply, we need more help from the state, and we need to pass this bill to provide predictability and stability for our renters and make a system that is currently not very fair, uh, more balanced, more fair, so renters can have what they need to know they have safe and secure housing. So I urge your support and I wanna thank you for hearing it today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, Madam Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Jenny Burdick and I represent the people of Senate District 18 in Southwest Portland, Northwest Portland, and Tigard. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on Senate Bill 608, and I want to begin by commending the speaker and the advocates uh, in, in all kinds of communities in Oregon who came up with what I consider a reasonable compromise, a bill that for the first time in the country will provide statewide protection for tenants from the abuses that we have unfortunately seen uh, with the for a variety of reasons, especially in my hometown of Portland. Uh, I speak as a tenant advocate today, but I also speak as a landlord. And I'm here to tell you, I've had a, I, I've been a landlord for 35 years, and I'm here to tell you that there is nothing in this bill that will disadvantage a responsible landlord. Uh, this provides the flexibility for responsible landlords to continue renting to tenants but it provides the protection that tenants need. Uh, everyone deserves a safe and secure place to live, and I enthusiastically um, urge your support for Senate Bill 608. Thank you. Chair, uh, Senator Shamia Fagan, and Vice Chair, Senator Fred Gerard, and members of the Senate Committee on Housing, thank you for hearing my testimony today. My name is Peter Courtney. I'm a state senator. I live in Northeast Salem. I'm here today to, to speak in support of Senate Bill 608. Housing is a very important issue in our state. So much so, I created a housing committee. This is hopefully the first of several bills that will be considered by this August committee. We cannot solve our housing crisis with just one bill. This measure is a start. It deals with dramatic rent increases and no cause evictions. It will be the first such legislation of its kind in the nation. It is a hybrid. It attempts to balance rent increases and rent regulations. It attempts to balance no cause evictions and evictions for cause. Other measures that hopefully will be considered in this committee and in the Ways and Means Committee increase funding for homeless shelters and community action agencies, encourage affordable housing 
and decrease barriers to new construction, increase housing density where it makes sense, especially around transit corridors, and finally issue bonds for affordable housing across the state of Oregon. Senate Bill 608 is a start. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Questions or comments for this panel? Get off easy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The next panel is Sybil Hebb and Katrina Holland. And then I'd also like Dr. Barton and Dr. Bangsberg to please come to the on deck chairs. Hi. Good afternoon. Please start in any order you prefer. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Katrina Holland. Uh, I serve as Executive Director of Community Alliance of Tenants, a statewide renters' rights organization that's been advocating for these protections for quite some time. Um, the most, most memorable, I'm sure, for folks in this room is uh, 2017 HB 2004, and of course this session, uh, SB 608. There's no new information, uh, no new angle to take, no special words I can conjure up to convey the myriad of tragedies that have transpired for hundreds of thousands of renters across Oregon. No matter how we talk about it, no matter how we phrase it, the fact of the matter is, is that under current law, close to half of our population can have their housing stability decided by someone else, even if just on a whim. Unfettered control over another's housing stability is currently legally permitted, as folks can legally get a 350 rent increase, as happened in Senator Burdick's district, or be told they don't have a home anymore for no reason through a no cause eviction slash termination. All of this is currently legal despite our state's commitment to equity despite our state's commitment to the safety and stability of all its residents, and despite our commitment to healthy communities. The effects over the last several decades have been nothing short of devastating. As you heard earlier, homelessness is rising faster than we can keep up. We rank number one in the nation for the amount of homeless students in our state, many of which have cited no cause evictions and rent increases as the number one causes. Teachers are living in their cars, for a couple of months after being newly hired at a school as they can't find housing they can afford. Businesses have called our offices complaining about losing employees because of being no cause evicted and so much more. Our housing crisis, as we heard from Senator Courtney, demands a solution that is multifaceted, investing in production, preserving affordable units, and by enacting common sense protective legislation like the one we are discussing today. So instead of rehashing all of the tragedies, as I'm sure you'll hear plenty from today, directly from those affected, I wanna talk about the positive effects to our state if we take this leap forward by enacting SB 608 into law. Some teachers may see improved behavior, behavior and better focus in classrooms as less children are bogged down with the reality of new homelessness from involuntary displacement. But simply, kids can focus better. Doctors may, may be more successful in treating their patients without disruptive external factors at home, like an impending eviction or rent increase that their patients can't afford and will render them homelessness, which is not an uncommon story that we have heard. Folks with health conditions may be better able to plan life-altering and in some cases, as we have heard on our hotline, life-saving surgeries because they may have a better idea of how their budgets will be impacted if their rent goes up a certain amount each year. Seniors who may have unexpectedly had to ration their prescriptions, this is not made up, because their rent increased 50%. Instead, they may be able to better plan their budgets and find a way to afford their medications since they weren't gouged. A shelter in Gresham may no longer be able to say that no-cause evictions are the number one cause of, fam of families facing new homelessness. Grocery bills, as we have heard, may stop being slashed in half. Families may be better able to save and stay put as they prepare to buy their first homes. Tenants may feel better about asking for a needed repair or coming to testify here, which some decided not to come because they were scared that their landlords would no cause evict them in retaliation. Lessening the heart-wrenching scenarios of people choosing to live in mold rather than asking for a repair out of fear of losing their homes. 
Victims of domestic violence may have better choices in leaving their abusers. Businesses may see less frequent turnover from their workers having to move far away, and perhaps even higher productivity from less stressed employees. Over a million people may have more opportunities to participate in our local economies and feel less hesitant about doing so as their budgets become slightly more predictable. And in some cases, as research has demonstrated and as you may hear today, we may see how higher housing production per capita than we previously did as recent research has demonstrated that in some rent-stabilized cities have seen some of the highest rates of production than other places in the nation that have produced more housing per capita than their non-rent-stabilized counterparts. Now I want to be clear that SB 608 is simply one piece of an ever-evolving puzzle. While it doesn't solve the entire housing crisis or solve for the hundreds of reasons for socioeconomic inequality, it certainly does take a giant leap forward by giving some measure of protection and predictability to hundreds of thousands of renters in hundreds of cities in 35 counties across our state. I've explained to many people in this building, many of us advocates in the room, and our membership of thousands across the state feel that SB 608 doesn't go far enough, but we all agree on one thing. SB 608 is one step forward that we have to take toward a strong foundation of even greater fairness in this system and stability. We must keep up this momentum. As we look ahead to what our state might become as a result of greater chances of housing stability for 1.4 million people in Oregon, we can all agree that not only is Oregon making history by passing SB 608, but we're on the right side. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Fagan, members of the committee, Sybil Hebb with the Oregon Law Center here to express our support for Senate Bill 608 and very much appreciate the time and attention to this issue and all of the great work and leadership that has uh, been put into bringing this bill forward. Um, from the Law Center's perspective, uh, our mission is to help our clients achieve access to justice and to help remove barriers to escaping poverty. Our clients are low-income Oregonians across the state and uniform in every county in the state, we hear from our client communities that stability and affordability of housing is their number one priority, their number one concern, and their greatest fear of losing. So for those reasons, the Law Center is here in support of Senate Bill 608. We have seen from recent studies uh, uh, from Harvard University that the sudden loss of a home due to eviction or extreme rent spikes is not only something that happens at a greater percentage to people who are living in poverty, it is also a causation of poverty. When one's life is disrupted suddenly without the ability to plan <coughs> into such a market as the, ones that, the one that we have here in the state where there are incredibly low vacancy rates and incredibly high rental rates, the spiral that is down word is, is very difficult to escape. And so for those reasons, we are committed to establishing greater protections against unjust evictions, no cause evictions, and extreme rent spikes that are the functional equivalent of eviction. For our clients, these issues are not just abstract examples, they are real. And I will just briefly describe two people with whom I've spoken in the recent weeks. I'll call her Nancy, from Southern Oregon, is a single mother with two children. She's lived in her home for eight years and was no cause evicted with others in her building with only 60 days notice. She ended up spending significant life savings on two weeks in a motel, then lived for two months in her car with her daughter. Her daughter missed significant levels of school and was no longer on track to graduate. So this is a clear example of some of the other much larger problems that our state is facing. If we had been able to provide her with greater notice and some ability to have a cushion before she was, uh, before her lease was terminated, she would have had a much greater ability to protect the stability of herself and her children and her child's school access. I also spoke with a gentleman this weekend who had just received a 113% rent increase. He already works two jobs. He's struggling to figure out how to avoid a 72-hour eviction and uh, is not certain where he will go next. So these are very real examples and they are very real uh, needs that we have that Senate Bill 608 will speak to. The bill is a very 
practical, reasonable, and balanced approach to what is a great crisis in our state. I will take a little bit of time to go through the outline of the bill, and then, as requested, I will respond briefly to the amendments which I have had a chance to review. As the committee staff ably described, during the first 12 months of occupancy, that a tenant is in a, a rental unit, landlords may continue to use no-cause notices just as they can under current law. A landlord may terminate a month-to-month -month tenancy without cause with a 30-day notice, and a landlord may choose not to renew a fixed-term lease without cause with a 30-day notice. After the first 12 months of occupancy is when the new just cause standard of the bill would kick in. As applied to month to month tenancies, a landlord would only be able to terminate for cause. That cause could be any one of the myriad landlord based or tenant based causes, excuse me, that exist in current law that apply anytime a tenant is in violation of a lease agreement. So for example, for non-payment of rent or for violation of the terms or for having an unauthorized pet, et cetera. All of those causes remain in effect. In addition, landlords would be able to make business and personal decisions about the use of their property by accessing one of four new landlord-based causes. And those causes are a landlord wants to move into the home or to have an immediate family member move into the home. A landlord needs to make repairs or renovations or wants to make repairs or renovations, and those repairs or renovations will render the unit unfit for occupancy or the unit is unfit for occupancy and needs repairs. A landlord has uh, accepted an offer to purchase a unit from a person who intends to move in and live in the unit as a primary residence or the landlord intends to demolish the unit or to convert the unit to a non-residential use. Those are the categories of causes that allow landlords to make business and personal decisions about how they wish to use the property. Those would be based not on tenant fault, but on the landlord's decision. And in those circumstances, the bill would provide that 90 days notice would be given to the tenant and one month's rent worth of relocation assistance would be paid to the tenant at the time of giving the notice so as to ease the tenant's burden in having to adjust suddenly without any fault of their own to needing to find a new home. There's an exemption from the relocation assistance requirement for any landlord that has four units or less. As applied to fixed term tenancies, the bill provides that after the first year of occupancy, fixed term tenancies would automatically roll over to month to month unless the tenant and the landlord agreed to a new fixed term tenancy. There's an additional, and a landlord could uh, choose not to uh, have the tenancy roll over into a month to month tenancy if there was a tenant based cause or if there were any one of the landlord based causes. Also, a landlord has an additional landlord based cause that they could use to decide not to turn the tenancy over into a month to month tenancy if the tenant has violated the lease three or more times prior to the end of the lease and the landlord has given warning to notices to the tenants at each time. In those circumstances, the landlord would not need to provide relocation assistance to the tenant. I'll move to the description of the statewide rent stabilization standards that are provided in the bill. These are groundbreaking. They would prevent extreme rent spikes and extreme rent gouging that are the functional equivalent of eviction. They would help protect the person I spoke to this weekend who is struggling even with paying two, working two jobs to pay his rent and who is unable to adjust to 113% rent increase. These provisions would apply both to quote unquote regular landlord tenant uh, um, units and also to manufactured home parks. And they provide that during a tenancy, a reasonable stability protection would apply and landlords would be allowed to raise the rent once a year, but only up to the cap of 7% plus the CPI in the Western region. This allows plenty of flexibility for a landlord to increase rents and to recoup costs that they need to recoup, but prevents against the 20%, 30%, 113% rent increases that we are seeing happening across the state right now. There are uh, reasonable exceptions to the rent provisions. New construction is exempted for a period of 15 years past the certificate of occupancy. Regulated affordable housing is, is exempted. 
and um, a landlord may reset the rent to market in between tenancies. These are reasonable provisions. They are taking into account all of the practices that we need to eradicate because they are unfair to tenants, but they are taking into account landlords' reasonable uh, needs. These provisions, when implemented, will be uh, workable for responsible landlords. They will ban practices that are displacing our communities at rates that we cannot get on top of, and they will help protect stability and fairness for tenants across the state. I'm mindful of time, but I want to make sure to just briefly touch, as the chair requested, on the amendments. There are five amendments. One of them would delete the emergency clause. I think it's important to reflect that we are in an emergency here across the state, and there are hundreds of thousands of tenants who are at risk of displacement at any time without any reason in a way in which bias can significantly disproportionately impact protected class communities. We need to act now. The Dash 2 Amendment creates an exception to the just cause standard for premise for significant improvements to premises and also creates a significant, uh, an exception to the rent stabilization provisions. The standard that is implied by the bill as it is written creates a 7% plus CPI, which right now is 10.3% overall. That is plenty of bandwidth within which a landlord may recoup costs and expenses uh, that they need to. And if they were to increase rents significantly greater than that, they would be looking at displacements and loss of tenants. So we think that this bill strikes the right balance. There's an exemption in uh, the Dash 3 amendment that seeks uh, an exception for condominium conversions. It's important to note that condominium conversions protects a, bar, a, a tenant's ability to make an offer to purchase the unit that they're living in when the landlord is selling the entire uh, set of units and converting them into condominiums. There's no reason that this bill cannot function uh, consistently within that notice of tenant, to tenants of an opportunity to purchase. The Dash 4 amendments create an exception for sales to borrowers who will move into the property to live there. I think it's uh, very important to recognize that this is, uh, that, this, that the state statute right now, the bill as drafted in Senate Bill 608, provides an exception for sales to owners, or to new purchasers who will move in. And there's plenty of leeway within that notice period for uh, purchases to to take place. I would also note that there are 18 other jurisdictions in the state of California that have longer notice periods than the one provided in this uh, bill, and uh, that has not been a problem there. And lastly, the Dash 5 Amendment uh, would propose uh, a preemption of local government's uh, abilities to make uh, reasonable relocation assistance. We uh, object to that and um, would uh, indicate that the City of Portland's relocation assistance ordinance has been extremely helpful to m preventing displacement. Um, so we, in short, appreciate the great work that's gone into putting this bill forward and think that the time to act is now and reasonable landlords will be able to implement this proposal in a way that protects stability for our communities. Thank you. Thank you both. Questions or comments for this panel? Just to let you know, colleagues, I'm not going to allow questions during the public hearing. So if you do have questions, uh, now would be the time to put them forward. These are the folks who have signed up for the hot seat. So questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Next, Dr. Oh, excuse me, Jim Straub and Ron Garcia. Chair Fagan, Vice Chair Gerard, and members of the committee, good afternoon and thank you for hearing my testimony today. My name is Jim Strom. I've been a landlord for 29 years and come to you today speaking as the Legislative Director for the Oregon Rental Housing Association. We consist of 14 local chapters with over 5,000 members located throughout the entire state. From La Grande to Coos Bay and Klamath Falls to Portland, we truly represent all of Oregon. I myself am a third generation landlord in Oregon. My grandfather, Bob Straub, was a senator, state treasurer, and eventually governor. He talked a lot about the need for innovative ideas in politics. Before, during, and after his time in public service, he was also a landlord. He taught me a lot about business and also about fairness. 
While I may not have his statesmanship credentials, I do possess the same ideals. Regarding Senate Bill 608, there is a lot here for landlords to dislike. But I would also like to recognize the bill for what it isn't, an industry killer. There are drastic changes for landlords and investors in Senate Bill 608, but as written, I do not believe that it will be catastrophic to our livelihood. Months ago, I heard rumors of a more robust version of last session's House Bill 2004, suggesting 2 to 3 percent rank caps, high relocation expenses, and limits on security deposits. For the first time ever, I went to my family and my wife, and I said, I think we should consider selling everything. The housing market favors the seller, and we ought to sell out and reinvest in something much safer. Ultimately, we decided not to do that, but for the first time ever, I had those conversations. I was afraid of the unknown and what it might mean to, to the viability of making a living as a landlord. After reviewing this bill, I believe most landlords will be able to adapt and operate within the parameters of the bill as written. This bill walks the fine line of protecting good tenants and at the same time does not encourage good landlords towards other investment vehicles. Most of my and my fellow landlords' fears regarding rent stabilization are that once established, it will become a one-way ratchet, opening the door for more stringent restrictions in the future. We all recognize that as more people become aware of how wonderful our state of Oregon is, demand has been outpacing su supply. This is a time for innovative ideas in the housing market, and maybe this bill will be part of the solution. We just don't know. If it is, in fact, a solution, Oregon Rental Housing Association certainly doesn't want to stand in the way. For that reason, Oregon Rental Housing Association is maintaining a neutral position on this bill. Thank you. Chair Fagan, members of the committee, thanks for having me. My name is Ron Garcia. Um, I've been a landlord, real estate broker, and property manager for over 30 years. I'm currently the legislative director for the Rental Housing Alliance, o Oregon, and we represent over 2,000 owners in the state with about 19,000 units. But I want to point out that 60% of our members own four units or less. And the hallmark of small landlords has always been to keep rents low to encourage good tenants who take care of their property and pay rent on time to stay. Small landlords have traditionally been the, set the standard for safe and affordable housing, neighborhood stability. Small landlords take pride in their property. They enjoy renting to people who enjoy living there. Small landlords take on an overproportioned amount of risk in their ownership <coughs> of their rental properties. Often, they have higher than average loan to value ratios, mortgages, taxes, utility expenses, and maintenance costs as compared to any other liquid assets they may have or compared to institutional landlords. But it's all with the notion that in the long run, a solid real estate investment offers their family the needed stability in their future to help offset retirement expenses, college, medical, other life essentials and emergencies that come up. Today, all landlords have been put on the defensive with the current dialogue and policy making over a housing crisis that's due in a large part because of the quality of life that Oregon has to offer. We're the number one in migration state in the country. But as written, it was, well, I, I want to say that a few years ago, it was recently that thousands of small, of owners became small landlords because they could not sell the property for what it was worth. And they managed their responsibilities, they weathered their risks, and in particular, they, the small landlords now find themselves cast as part of the problem instead of being encouraged and welcomed at the table as, as part of the long-term solution for affordable housing. As written, SP 608 does have exemptions for small landlords and, of course, for new construction for rental units, which would allow the market to maintain necessary grassroots strategies for tens of thousands of small landlords uh, statewide, and it provides incentives for all investors to add and build the much-needed housing stock that's going to build our way out of this <coughs> crisis. Both of these factors will greatly help easing the housing crush, crunch in the future. So because of this, as a representative for the Rental Housing Alliance Oregon, we hereby submit our neutrality on SP 608 in its drafted form presented to this committee. However, because the changes this bill creates are far-reaching, we respectfully urge the committee to remove the emergency provision in order to allow the housing community as a whole to prepare for its proper adaptation and implementation. 
and we hope lawmakers will continue to seek the input, support, and most of all, help protect the rights of small landlords throughout their discernment in ho housing policies. Thank you. Questions or comments for this panel? All right, you're saving them all for the last panel. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, so the next panel is Dr. Barton and Dr. Bangsberg. On deck is Shannon Call Callahan, Mayor Mark Gamba, Councillor Jackie L Leung, and Councillor Ellen Ponomarf. Marif. And just one quick announcement, the microphones are actually incredibly sensitive, so go ahead and keep actually a little bit of distance, at least a fist distance from the microphone. You don't have to speak right into it. We think probably people will let us know if they can't hear you, mm -hmm. but it's hard for people to follow online if you're too close to the microphone, your, your voice sounds a little muffled. So with that, go ahead. Okay, um, <clears throat> I have a PowerPoint presentation. Ah, there it is, okay, great, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> Chair Fagan and members of the committee, um, my name is Stephen Barton. I'm currently retired. I'm formerly the housing director for the city of Berkeley and deputy director of its rent stabilization program. I have a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. I'm the author of numerous articles on housing policy and economics, and I've taught at San Francisco State University and I'll wrap that up there. Um, so I want to start in on why the um, letting the market rip is not going to bail you out of the affordability crisis, although I'm certainly supportive of efforts to get more housing built. Um, so first, let's just take a look at the current situation, which is um, shown in this chart. This chart covers the period from 1950 um, through 2017. It uses data from the Consumer Price Index for, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the, uh, the dark solid line is the trend in real rents, and by real I mean uh, in constant dollars and constant quality. Um, the dark line is uh, all U.S. cities, and the dotted line is the Portland-Salem metropolitan area. There, there is no equivalent data for the state of Oregon as a, as a unit. So, <clears throat> now, in the period immediately after World War II and the Korean War, um, <clears throat> you can see that real rents actually went down fairly substantially. There was increasing housing affordability on until the early 1980s. <clears throat> then they began to gradually rise, and over the last five or six years, the rent increases have been quite extraordinary. Um, they may very well <clears throat> um, moderate, I'm sure they will moderate uh, at some point in the n near future, but even if they actually level off, they would be leveling off at levels that are higher than we have ever had in the post-World War II period. Now, why is it that over the past 35 years the supply has not been keeping up with the demand? Well. Um, new construction is a costly and slow process. Currently, the state of Oregon like, and the state of California are adding less than 1% annually to their housing stock. Um, people often say, oh, the problem is restrictive land use regulations, and I'm personally all in favor of eliminating exclusionary single-family zoning and making it easier to build housing at higher densities, but we have to recognize that infill development is more expensive, that land costs more, um, that there are higher construction costs for higher density construction. It requires more skill on the part of the construction workers. And currently there's a nationwide shortage of skilled construction workers. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, even when, if one overcomes that, then you also have to be able to provide the infrastructure, the, uh, the, the roads, the transit systems, the parks, the schools, et cetera, that are necessary for the, to serve the, the new housing, and that's expensive. Um, 
Now, all the things I've just talked about are fairly widely understood. What's not understood is that there's a serious disconnect on the demand side. New rental housing is not built because lots of people can't afford the current housing and are paying more rent. New rental housing is built for the higher income sector of tenants who pay rents that are high enough to pay off the costs of construction. Most tenants can't afford new housing. They live in older housing where the costs of construction were paid off long ago, what's normally called the, the filtering down process, the housing that was once new but is now rented for lower rents because um, it's old, become older housing and is in some ways superseded by the newer housing. So you have increasing need at all rent levels, but rent increases in older housing do not result in the production of additional older housing. <laughs> it's not how it works. So <clears throat> there is no market mechanism that links the production of new housing to the need for older housing. And the result is that the market tends to systematically undersupply housing. Their recent uh, <clears throat> study by the annual State of the Nation's Housing by the Harvard-MIT Joint Center on Housing reports that uh, vacancy rates have gone up in the upper end of the housing market, sort of the top fifth, and <clears throat> that as a result, new housing, uh, multifamily housing construction has slowed even though vacancy rates remain extremely low below that top fifth. So if we go back to the chart I started with, we can talk a bit about why it is that um, the filtering down process worked so splendidly in the post-war period and has stopped working. And I will focus in on just a couple of points. One is that in the post-World War II period, um, as the American economy grew, that prosperity was broadly shared. So uh, incomes of most Americans steadily increased. What's been happening since the roughly 1980 is that most of that increasing, econo most of that economic growth has resulted in increasing prosperity for the top 20% and indeed disproportionately for the top 1%, but it hasn't been widespread. So whereas in the earlier period, people had more money that they could afford to put into housing, um, that's no longer the case for a big proportion of the population. And in that earlier period, we had a major change in the structure of urban America, and that is suburbanization, the development of highways, mass production of automobiles, the availability of what was now, um, now in the 1950s and 60s, easily accessible, inexpensive land that resulted in a major suburban home building boom. So everybody with their increasing incomes moved up. Actually, I say everybody big bracket for the racially exclusionary nature of a lot of that moving up. But, um, and what after, by the time you get to the 1980s, most of the easily reachable inexpensive land is, um, is used and now you're faced with, as I mentioned, the increasing costs of infill housing or um, pretty long commutes to outlying areas in order to get to inexpensive land. So um, for the past more than 35 years, um, the American economy has not been delivering the uh, rate of additional new housing construction that would be necessary to keep rents level. And um, unless there's some major, major change it doesn't seem likely that it will happen in the foreseeable future, important as new housing construction is. So you're going to have to look at all kinds of other methods of dealing with the housing affordability problem. Now, I can just speak generally to, um, to the, um, the proposed law. Uh, one thing I will note is that um, 
a rent, an increase, a, um, a limit to rent increases of some sort is essential in order for good cause to eviction, for eviction to be workable because otherwise landlords could use say a 50% rent increase to economically evict a tenant um, where they didn't want and couldn't meet the good cause requirement. So what it will do is it will slow displacement. You heard a lot about that already. I won't spend more time going into it. I would also suggest that it's likely to reduce certain kinds of fairly abusive speculation in the housing market. Um, you know, investors have quite a range of, of strategies. Some maximize rents, others keep rents somewhat below market in order to encourage tenant stability. Um, when an investor who has been focused on stability eventually sells, it creates an opportunity for somebody who is into maximizing the rent to come in and do drastic increases. And worse than that, there are some investors who will buy these properties and then also under maintain them for a couple of years, knowing that it takes a while before the results of under maintenance really impact the, the housing, thus driving up the net operating income and enabling them to do a quick resale in a, a year or two um, and stick the next buyer with the deferred maintenance. So, <coughs> Um, I'll just try and speak briefly to a couple of concerns that I've um, that I've heard. So one is that um, no, a, an act like this will not discourage new construction. You have a 15-year exemption, um, and people develop housing. They go to their uh, potential construction lenders with um, a developer pro forma that you, um, has to have relatively conservative uh, future rent increases built in because the bank doesn't want to themselves speculate on extremely rapid rent increases. And the, so um, normally they would be projecting rent increases that are at or just above the rate of inflation and really there are a whole lot of much stronger forms of rent regulation around the United States and the, the studies that have been done um, really find no effect on new construction. Similarly, it's not going to discourage major renovations. Um, if, for example, a landlord needed to put in a new foundation or do seismic work, um, they're in most cases going to be taking out an additional mortgage loan or refinancing. So they'll be paying for this over a period of 10 or 20 years. That means that the monthly cost of, um, you know, of, re of repayment will be um, low enough that in almost all cases, the 7% on top of the consumer price index should be um, quite sufficient to uh, cover the cost and if it turns out not to be enough in the most expensive cases, then one year later, the, the proposed law allows yet another 10% increase. So um, I, I don't think that that's gonna be a serious issue either. So with that, I will conclude what I have to say. Thank you, Dr. Barton. <laughs> Senator Fagan. Senators Gerard, Chair and Vice Chair and members of the committee, I'm David Bangsbert. I'm founding dean of the Oregon Health and Sciences University and Portland State University School of Public Health. I'm also a physician and a native Oregonian. Prior to becoming dean of the OHSU PSU School of Public Health, I supervised over 15 years of research on homelessness. As a public health dean, investigator, physician, and advocate to end homelessness, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 608. Everyone needs a safe and stable place to call home, and communities thrive when we create social and physical environments that promote good health for all. Health starts in our homes. The research has shown that there's a consistent link between health and housing. A lack of affordable and adequate housing can have has profound health consequences. 
Without a home, it's difficult to man your, maintain your health, store and take medications, rest, or recover from illness. No cause evictions and extreme rent increases also cause incredible stress for families. Many people who rent their homes have shared stories about living in fear of another notice from their landlords and this extreme stress has a severe, severe impact on health. Renters have shared stories about living in seriously substandard housing conditions with moldy, drafty windows, rodents, and other things incompatible with a healthy home. And because of no cause evictions, renters are all too often afraid to report these conditions because they know if they, will, if they complain or assert their rights or ask for repairs, they will receive a no cause eviction. A study by the National Center on National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty found that evictions, whether through formal court proceedings or other methods of involuntary displacement from housing, are a direct cause of homelessness. No cause evictions and extreme rent increases can for some residents of our state, and particularly now because of the shortage of available homes, cause homelessness. People who rent their homes are depending on this legislature to act to provide basic protections and rent stability. <coughs> we know we need to address a range of issues to solve our homeless crisis that our communities are saving. Senate Bill 608 is an important step forward to preventing homelessness. Please vote yes to Senate Bill 608. Thank you all for your service and giving the OHSU, PSU, a school of public health, and myself an opportunity to speak on behalf of Senate Bill 608. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, last chance to ask questions. This is our last kind of invited panel. Okay. All right, with that, I'm going to call up uh, Shannon Callahan, Mayor Mark Gamba, and Councillor Eleanor Ponomareff. Yeah. Wow. And on deck is Deborah Imsey. Anna Hawkins and Jill Russell. And just a quick, so this is the, the kind of public hearing portion. So you'll notice up there, uh, we will be, the kind of the final number is in, there's about twice as many people here in support of the bill as opposed to the bill. So we'll be hearing kind of two panels in support of the bill and one panel opposed, just to, ba to balance that out. We'll also be working to hear folks who have heard, who've traveled 100 miles or more early in the, in the evening, whether for or against, so that they can get on the road. And we also have, looks like some folks with some um, disability challenges that will also be working to get up early in the panel so they can um, get, get home as well. So please continue in whatever order you prefer. Good afternoon, Chair Fagan, members of the uh, committee. For the record, I'm Mark Gamba, I'm the mayor of Milwaukee. Over several decades, housing prices have climbed much faster than the income of the average person. As a matter of fact, there is not a single neighborhood anywhere in our region where the average full-time wage-earning renter can afford to rent a modest two-bedroom rental house or apartment. In the last few years in Milwaukee, prices in the rental market have gone up as much as 50%. 43% of all renters in the city spend more than 30% of their income on housing. Nearly a quarter of all renters spend more than half of their income on housing. Roughly 400 kids in the North Clackamas School District are homeless. Thousands more in, live in desperate poverty, in homes where regular meals are unlikely, and the best nutrition they get each day comes at school. Because parents have to choose between paying the rent and buying food. About six months after we passed our 90-day no, uh, no-cause eviction rule, this sweet little old uh, retired school teacher called me as a last-ditch effort to see if I could find a place she and her disabled husband could afford. She had spent the previous two and a half months looking for something within their very limited fixed incomes. They were in their late 70s and early 80s. She was grateful that she had been given the extra time to find a place, but in the end, it hadn't mattered. It comes quick, doesn't it? It's really quick. <laughs> Should I finish or not? Oh, well, I, we can't let everybody finish, so if you just... Um, all right, I'll cut the story about the old folks. Uh, for years now, I've been advocating to have the state preemption on rent control and no-cause evictions listed, lifted. This bill is even better. It won't allow developers to pit cities against each other in a race to the bottom. 
Instead, we will all be equal. It is also superior to rent control in that landlords will be able to cha charge market rate for new tenants, keeping the brakes off development. In conversations I've had with developers, I've been told that their deals with financiers usually last, usually have about a 10 to 12 year payback period. So 15 year exclusion for new construction should be plenty of time for new housing to continue apace. Until we as a society determine that no one who works full time should be living in poverty, tourniquets like this will be needed to stop the bleeding. I would ask for you to support this important bill. Thanks. Chair Fagan, uh, Vice Chair uh, Garad, and members of the committee. Um, I am Shannon Callahan, uh, the director of the Portland Housing Bureau. I'm here on behalf of the city of Portland to respectfully urge you to support Senate Bill 608. Also, you will find a letter of support from our Portland City Council submitted to you in OLIS. Um, over 46% of households in the city of Portland are renters. Renter households are disproportionately low income and also from communities of color. The average rental unit in the city of Portland is now over $1,400 a month. Renters are experiencing high rates of displacement due to the rising cost of rent and stagnant incomes. This, this displacement has created a great need in our city and in the state to, to modernize our services and our regulations. When compared with other similar jurisdictions across the nation, the rental housing market in Portland and in Oregon is largely missing a modern regulatory framework to maintain a healthy market for both renters and landlords. Renter households deserve a reasonable threshold to rely on for their housing, for their security, and for their peace of mind. The unexpected need to move following a no-cause eviction or rent increases places an incredible burden on households, particularly those with low incomes or households with children or those, in, um, those who have a disability. This bill helps fill those regulatory gaps and provides clear expectations for landlords and for renters. Thank you for your consideration of this bill and the opportunity to testify this afternoon. Amazing. <laughs> right on the button. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Eleanor Panomareff, and I am a city councilor for talent, and I'm here to speak in support of the bill. We know that Oregon has a housing crisis and that renters are hit particularly hard. In talent, almost 40% of uh, households are rentals, and according to our housing needs analysis of 2017, 56% of renters are cost burdened. We see this as an economics problem, and yes, that's true. But on top of the challenges of having to make ends meet, renters in my city are in a constant state of anxiety. Even if they do everything right, Every, any day they might be forced out, either by an unexpected rent increase or a no-cause eviction. A couple of days ago, one renter told me it's an uphill battle every day and it's making people angry. It was less than a year ago when I stood with tenants at Mariposa Apartments in Medford protesting a rent increase of 40%. The property owner called it a business decision. Business decisions have consequences, and until now, the consequences have been paid by everybody except for the property owners. The schools, where the kids are distracted and lack sleep, the employers, where um, the people working there are uh, not focusing on their work, but rather looking for apartments, and the communities that are losing cohesion because of so much churn. Um, this bill will not solve the, the housing crisis, but it will bring some peace of mind and stability to people in my city and communities all over Oregon, and I urge you to pass this long overdue legislation, and thank you for your hard work. <laughs> I can't believe I'm setting an example. Thank you very much. So the next panel is Deborah Imsey, Anna Hawkins, and Jill Russell, and on deck is Patty J, Rachel Frederico, Paula Penna, and Joseph Tomlin. So if those folks would come up to the on deck chairs. Chair Fagan, Vice Chair Gerard, and members of the Senate Committee on Housing. My name is Deborah Imsey. I'm the Executive Director for Multifamily Northwest. Multifamily Northwest members <clears throat> provide housing to Oregonians for more than a quarter of a million rental homes, making us the largest rental provider group in Oregon. All of us who work on housing agree there's a housing shortage in Oregon. Supply is not meeting demand. And when supply decreases, cost increase. This is why housing is currently not affordable for far too many Oregonians. Some people think that rent control or rent stabilization is the answer. 
It seems logical if we force rental providers to limit the rents that they are, can charge, then prices will go down, right? Unfortunately, that's not what happens. Economists have studied rent control and stabilization throughout the country, and data as recently as the 2018 show that where rent control or stabilization have been implemented, the results have been higher rents and fewer rental units overall. Whether you call it old school rent control or the more modern rent stabilization, we have found even respected economists do not support any kind of rent stabilization to making housing more affordable. At best, SB 608 will have no effect, but at worst, it will make housing less affordable in the long run. The evidence shows six, Senate Bill 608 will not help solve the problem of housing affordability. It will actually make the problem worse. Thank you. My name is Anna Hawkins. I'm from Malin, Oregon, and I am going to read you um, an email that my Uncle Matt, who owns First Choice Property Management, wrote. We currently have a regulation banning rent increases during the first year of tenancy in a month-to-month -month tenancy. Not letting market forces control rental rates after the first year will inhibit upgrades and property enhancements, especially in the targeted 15-year-old and older buildings. This law will serve to restrict investment in our state from future investors as all buildings will be within one to 14 years being subject to these regulation. Rent control has been proven in the unintended consequences everywhere it is tried. In the same building in San Francisco, rents for the same size apartments range from 300 to 3,000. Please bear in mind that originally San Francisco had a 7% annual escalator now, the rate is only 1.6%. One unintended problem is disputes between tenants. A new tenant forced to pay a disproportionately higher rent due to de decreased free market supply is frustrating. I personally remodeled a small apartment complex that the property taxes on the property before the remodel were $1,089.97. The property taxes after the remodel are $4,053.70. That is a 372% increase. The head of city code enforcement, Charles Anderson, told me that the crime in the block area of the building had dropped 93% because of the remodel. Good afternoon, my name is Jill Russell. Um, Senator Fagan and Vice Chair Gerard, thank you for letting us speak today. I am also opposed. Um, a lot of my clients as a realtor have decided instead of keeping their units as rentals, if this is enacted, they'd rather sell their properties, which would limit our ability to have more rentals in our small town of Klamath Falls. And we have less, um, less properties for people to rent. And many of my clients who are investors are saying the same thing. They're waiting to see what happens and they're not gonna continue to invest in our community to have those rentals for the people that need them. So thank you for your time. <laughs> So the next panel is Patty J, Rachel Frederico, Paula Penna, and Joseph Tomlin. And on deck is Trell Anderson, Stefan Ostrich, Cliff Jones, and Chris Bonner. Why sit here? Excuse me. Cool. Thanks. Good afternoon, Chair Fagan and respected committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to tell our story of our no cause eviction and why the passage of Senate Bill 608 is so important for our communities. My name is Patty Jay. I'm a citizen of Milwaukee, where my three sons and I have lived for over 10 years. I served in the Oregon Air National Guard and continue to serve our community women veterans through a program I founded almost four years ago. Throughout two bouts of cancer, sudden layoffs, and a divorce due to domestic violence, I have worked very hard to provide a secure and happy home for my sons. In February of 2016, we were renting a duplex from a private owner in Milwaukee. We had lived there for over a year, paid our rent, and were considerate tenants. We had no idea that our landlord had other plans for us. One morning while recovering from surgery, I went to the mailbox and upon returning, discovered a 60-day notice to vacate tacked on the wall next to our door. I did not receive a notice in the mail nor in person as required by law. I had no idea why this was happening as there was no explanation nor reason listed. 
I did have a suspicion that it may have something to do with the black mold in the bathroom that I had complained about. The timing of our eviction notice was the day after the work was completed. Going once and again into survivor mode, I contacted Clackamas County Veterans Services and was able to find a new apartment. However, we have the fear and vulnerability like a cloud hanging over us. We do now pay more than $500 more of a month. My eldest son expressed this way, for me, eviction, especially without cause, has had a really unsettling and alienating event. Without the security of a house, there is no home. Without the security of a neighborhood, there is no community. Without need for justification in eviction, there is no justice. Please pass this bill. Thank you. Why don't, why don't you go next, since you're next to her? Yeah, thank you. And let's, let's put the mic over close enough oh, to of them so they can see it. Thank you. My name is Joseph Tomlin. I am from Ashland. And first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, give a big thank you to Chair Fagan and to Vice, Ch Vice Chair Giraud for this great opportunity to speak to you today. I would also like to thank the Oregon Senate for prioritizing the housing crisis and establishing this committee. My name is Joseph Tomlin, like I said, and currently I am couch surfing with whatever generous people help me out while I look for housing. I have been a renter in Ashland for almost five years. And up until the point that I was evicted, Currently, it's I had sorry I had uh, been evicted four times for no co no cause whatsoever in those five years. I asked my landlady about the reasoning behind the eviction, and she simply gave me a clear notice, stating in paperwork that there was no reason for it at all. This proposal is a result of two years of debate, consideration, and work. This is a compromise, but it is still a well vetted and fair bill that would protect tenants. It is a crucial first step for Oregon housing rights. If this bill was passed, it would not only protect myself from this bad situation, but it would protect the one in three people in Jackson County that pay more than 50% of their income to rent. This bill would create a true just cause eviction standard, banning no cause evictions in most tenancies across the state, prevent extreme rent, rent increases, and provide important stability during a tenancy. It will also help to curb our massive problem with displacement. People who rent their homes deserve at least this basic level of protection, and we should act now to implement these fundamentals. Oregonians cannot wait any longer. Please pass SB 608. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paula. I am actually here to testify on behalf of my parents and my sister who are afraid of retaliation. I am the daughter of a former former migrant workers and the daughter of one of the first few fully bilingual heavy equipment operators in the state of Oregon. Um, this is a story about some hardworking people, uh, my parents who are now senior citizens and on a fixed income, and my sister um, who is a renter. Um, my dad is 64, year, 64 years young come this March. My mom just turned 62. About two years ago, my father began the process of early retirement due to health, and my mother had to retire early as well because she is her, she's the main caretaker. Um, currently, they both currently get, um, their fixed income is about $2,700 combined, and they qualify for state assistance. And, um, and that, it also includes money that I give them to watch my youngest child, who's two years old. About the same time that my father began his retirement process, he got, they got their first of five rent increases. Um, 18 months ago, their rent was 500, beginning May 1st. Their rent will now be $975, about the rent, um, and this is rent gouging that we're talking about. At the same time, my sister was diagnosed with stage two kidney renal failure, and while she was on medical leave, she ended up um, with a rent increase of over 30%. I didn't get all of it, but. It's been in writing, too. We appreciate that. Thank you. Chair Fagan and members of the committee, thank you for your time. My name is Rachel Federico. I'm an attorney with Legal Aid Services of Oregon. I help represent low-income Oregonians in both Marion and Polk County. I'm here to express to you that no cause evictions are routine in um, our practice. I often have to give very bad news to clients who are coming to me looking for hope. I have to often tell the clients sitting before me that they need to find new housing in what's become an impossible market. 
even if the notice was unfairly issued or devastating, uh, raising um, defenses can be very difficult. I've seen clients who have lived in fear of asserting their rights and have um, not wanted to come forward. I submitted a letter that I hope you will all read detailing some of their stories, including a sexual assault survivor who didn't come forward for many years because she was afraid that she would be evicted. The risk of retaliation is very real in today's market. I've provided an example of a client named Robert, and I hope that you'll read his story. And I just want to impress upon you that my office does see the bad cases. No doubt there are many more wonderful landlords out there not abusing power, but currently the bad actors are emboldened by the ability to no cause evict their tenants. Thank you for your time. Next panel is Trell Anderson, Stefan Ostrich, Cliff Jones, and Chris Bonner. And on deck, we have Daryl Rothen Rothenbaker, Adam S Swind from Tillamook County, and David Nace from Washington, and David Bean. So those are on deck. My name is Stefan Ostrak, and I live in uh, rural Lane County just outside the uh, city of Eugene border. I'm a retiree who owns five residential properties, and my rentals provide a significant share of my income. I fully support SB 608, the Tenant Protection Bill. It is fair and reasonable. As a rental property owner, I hate the term landlord, it sounds futile. I can't imagine evicting a tenant without cause. I've had some bad tenants, but this law would not have prevented me from getting them out of my property. The causes <laughs> set forth in the bill are all that are needed. I also think the limits on rent increases in this bill are more than generous. Cost of living plus 7% is way more than I can imagine raising rents. The biggest expenses borne by owners like me are mortgage and taxes. My mortgages are fixed rate. They don't go up 7% a year. Property tax increases are limited to 3% per year. Responsible owners budget for maintenance and repairs and establish reserves. As a rental property owner, I'm also a member of the community. Housing stability for my neighbors and tenants is important to me. The provisions of SB 608 are not onerous. I support it without qualification. Good afternoon, Chair Fagan and members of the Senate Housing Committee. Uh, my name is Cliff Jones. Uh, I'm here in support of Senate Bill 608. Uh, I was a beneficiary of my father's estate and took ownership of six properties, uh, plexes and single family units. When my father had a stroke, <clears throat> I began managing his affairs and I asked him what was important to him with his rental units. Uh, seeking guidance to further his wishes. He said, give people a chance who have a harder life than his. As a family, we have made, made a commitment to provide affordable housing to people in our community while also maintaining a stable income. After my father passed away, I have maintained that commitment. As a landlord who would be subject to the proposed bill, I'm urging you to support Senate Bill 608. I believe it's just common decency. I do not think it's fair for tenants across the state to live day by day with the uncertainty of a possible no-cause eviction when they pay their rents on time. I also believe that the upward limit of 7% annual rate increase above inflation is more than fair to landlords while protecting tenants from the kind of sudden, sudden rent gouging that we're seeing in all parts of Oregon. There are frankly too many people in this business who operate as if people's homes are a blank check for them to write themselves. Um, so Senate Bill uh, 608 is the right thing to do, protecting rent and renting individuals and families. Thank you. Thank you. Good 
afternoon, Chair Fagan, Vice Chair Gerard, and members of the Senate Committee on Housing. My name is Chris Bonner, and I'm a principal broker with the Hassan Company, and I've been a full-time residential realtor in the greater Portland metropolitan area since 1990. I have seen firsthand how housing instability has risen dramatically due to increases in rents, lack of adequate tenant protections, and the overall effect of market forces left unchecked. I have also been in the past a landlady and currently sell investment property for and to folks as well. So I know well that there are things to take into account when crafting legislation that affects an investment property owner rights. I think this legislation strikes a fair balance between allowing for folks to make a profit and taking steps towards solving our current housing crisis. I think any small inconvenience caused by these new requirements are more than offset by the benefits and I don't see anything in this bill that will stop realtors from being able to do what we do best, helping sellers and buyers navigate challenges to accomplish their goals. Thank you for your hard work on this issue. I think you have crafted an effective and fair bill, and I'm here to voice my strong support for Senate Bill 608. Thank you. Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, Chair Fagan, members of the committee. My name is Trell Anderson. I'm the executive director of Northwest Housing Alternatives. We're a premier nonprofit, mission based affordable housing provider throughout the state of Oregon. We were established in 1982. We have nearly 1,900 units in our portfolio and almost 800 in unit production right now. On any given night, some 2,900 people sleep under our rooftops. These are folks who are families with children, seniors, veterans, people with various disabilities. We also run the Annie Ross House, which is the only family homeless shelter in Clackamas County. We're based in Clackamas, but we have a statewide <coughs> geographic focus. We have properties in 16 counties, uh, including Hermiston, Gresham, Florence, Hines. We're expanding to Ontario, and of course, in the Portland metro area. I'm here today as a landlord to testify in support of Senate Bill 608 to protect people from the market churn and to protect people from landlords who otherwise would shortcut what I call due process. At NHA, we only undertake four cause evictions because we believe in the dignity of due process. When we do have to evict and we take our time and we make sure we get the facts right, we document the notes, we check on-site videos, we interview neighbors, and if we have to, we work with local police. As you know, many children are impacted across the state because of this market churn. I ask for your support, and thank you for your time. The next panel up is David Nace, David Bean, Daryl Rothenbaker, and Adam Schwend. Up after that is Jesse Sharp, Samantha Frost, Marlene Barbie, and Jennifer Aviles. If those could come to the on deck, that'd be great. Thank you. Am I selected to go first? This looks like it. Sure. Thank you, Chair Fagan, uh, for this opportunity. My name is David Nace. I own and operate a property management company, and I am um, also a landlord myself with several properties. And I just want to um, point out some of the things that have not been touched is one of them is that in every circumstance I've ever used a no-cause notice is to protect the tenant or other tenants. And the reason I didn't give them a for-cause notice, or excuse me, I, I use a no-cause notice, but the only reason I wouldn't give them a for-cause notice is because I don't want them to have that stigmatism on their record. And when you do give a for-cause notice and they go to rent from somebody else, that shows up on their record. <laughs> and they cannot rent. And a person like me will not rent to them, especially if they owe a landlord money. Some of the things that aren't being said here is the reasons why some of these people were given four cause notices. And I urge all of you to take these names that you have, that you have real cases of, find out their landlords and talk to the other side, please. Because there are good reasons why we do that. Ms. Fagan, I gave you several of them the other day when I talked to you. I gave Mr. Golden a couple of them too. And there are good reasons why we use these notices. As far as rent increases go, 
we the stabilization of rent is going to be hard to do um, for one reason is it's it's going to increase prices like it has in other states and if you look at the history you'll see that thank you Mr. Um, Chairman and everybody, <clears throat> my name's David Beam. I'm a spokesman for all the disability people in the state of Oregon for, di for disabilities. And I urge you to support this bill statewide because a lot of disability people, deaf and the blind, need that because a lot of them got to have to go to work. You, put, you don't have this a program for housing, and a lot of them going to be out in the cold or get rested, and they've got nowhere else to go. And I was thinking uh, uh, mental health needs to work on this problem too, because counties don't have the money to get, get this done. Why come you can't get it from the lottery office and get this going for the homeless people and get housing for them? That's what I'd like to see done. Take some of that money the lottery has and use that for homeless people as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator Fagan. And Members of the committee, Mr. Nope, it's nice to see you from the fairer side of the state of the mountains. I'm Daryl Rothenbooker, and I have brought my son Gabriel here from Prineville, and my wife and I own Wild West Property Management. My frustration with this bill is how the process has been changed in the past few years where groups for landlords and tenants would get together and whatever both groups could decide upon, that package would be sent to Salem and passed with bipartisan support. Now, however, special interest groups on both sides have convinced their district politicians to abort that process. This is a huge reason why residents all over the state are losing trust in their politicians, as this gives them direct evidence that the res representatives will do the bidding of special interests instead of working to find common ground. I encourage our state politicians to have the courage to tell the special interest groups to begin working with each other again to find common ground. If this bill passes and no-cause notices to vacate or remove from a landlord's ability to be used, my fear is the landlords will become far more stringent in serving violation notices. Where previously a text or a phone call asking tenants to take care of a violation uh, that may be minor uh, to prevent a demerit from going into their file, now, instead, this per thanks to this particular part of the bill, it isn't difficult to see how landlords will have no choice but to protect, them protect themselves by issuing violation notices from the very beginning of a tenancy for the smallest of infractions. In my opinion, this would add even more stress and worry to tenants who would now l have to walk on pins and needles fearing the slightest misstep instead of giving them the peace of mind this bill seeks to give them. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Fagan, members of the committee, thank you. I come from snowy Tillamook. Uh, my name is Adam Schwend. I am a small business, business owner and principal broker for Coast Real Estate Professionals. Uh, we have a lot of common problems in the state of Oregon, but we come from, uh, we have different solutions for every part of the state. Not every sol solution works everywhere. For example, in the city of Tillamook, over 90% of property owners, they aren't big corporations with big legal actual, le legal departments that can implement a lot of the uh, restrictions and deal with the risk. They're mom and pop organizations with one, two, three units that depend on that for their income and their retirement. Last week, one of them came into my office and said, I can't do this anymore. I can't afford the risk. And they began the process of selling all of their homes their rental homes. Those, I can almost guarantee you based on our market, they will not become rentals again. In, in Tillamook, like many communities, we are proud of the fact that we come together and bring solutions that fit for us, but we don't presume that those solutions are going to work for Portland or for Prineville or for Salem or for Medford. And so we ask that you please don't impose a statewide mandate on us that will fail to address our problems and actually make us lose ground on the hard work that we've done for providing affordable housing for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next panel is Jesse Sharp, Samantha Frost, Marlene Barbie, and Jennifer Aviles. And on deck, I'm going to have Jackie McGee, Meg Tinnen. Michelle Glass and Peggy Catch, K A T C H. <laughs> Jack. 
Dr. Fagan, Vice Chair Gerard, thank you so much for having me um, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jesse Sharp. I work for the Community Alliance of Tenants. I'm a longtime resident of Jackson County and live today in Medford. Um, I'm coming here to urge you to support SB 608. Currently in our county, we have an enormous number of homeless children. In Medford alone, 10% of the school district experienced homelessness last year. Right up the street from my house, I'm right on the edge and can drive right out to Butte Falls where I often get calls from. There, 27% of children experienced homelessness last year. It is a part of our everyday experience working with families, working with children, working with single mothers to watch people fall into homelessness. In part because of my position, what I am always seeing is that that results either from drastic rent increases or no cause evictions. While there can be other causes, and certainly that is not something that we can statistically track, that is my experience, and I think it is entirely crucial that you pass this bill and support the homeless people in rural Oregon or the tenants who are at risk of becoming homeless. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Samantha Frost. I am a veteran um, of the military, the Air Force, um, and I live in Roseburg, Oregon. Um, two years ago, I was I was pushed out of an apartment um, in Sutherland, Oregon, because uh, they tried to increase the rent three hundred dollars, um, and I was only paying seven seventy five. Uh, I couldn't afford it, so basically they said, "Well, you either pay the increase or you bye bye." So I said, oh, "Bye." I guess. Um, so um, uh, when I was pushed out, I found um, veterans housing, and that wasn't any better um, because um, there was prostitution and drug trafficking in this veterans facility on federal grounds. Um, I said something, and they tried to evict me based off of that. So I have um, I the SB. Um, the Senate Bill 608, um, I think, is good in both parts by reducing the increase of rent, and it would actually um, make it, you know, disabled veterans like me, um, it would not restrict us from being evicted for, for talking about issues like this, but it would it would eliminate the no cause eviction, even though they would probably try to find cause, but it still would eliminate the no the no cause eviction itself. So um, thank you so much. Hi, my name is Marlene Barbary. Leave a little bit of like about a fist worth of, or a little bit more space. That's perfect. Is that thank good? You. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Marlene Barbary. I'm a veteran, and I also believe that this Senate bill is necessary, not only for the humanization side of it, but just for the fact that males, females, children are all being suffering and thrown out of places that they should not have to leave. The, uh, the increases of the rent, mine, unfortunately, only went up 12.5 percent, but it was within that one year of once being notified with the 90-day notification, which wasn't 90 days, it was less than 70 days. The one year was only seven months, that my, me being in that facility. And being in that facility, it was one of, it's one of those things when you are on a set income, you've served your country, you're female, you've been a single mother. There are things that humanization needs to step up and re realize we need help. And this committee here can help us. I'd like to see that. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next panel is Jackie McGee, Meg Tinnen, Michelle Glass, and Peggy Catch. And on deck, I'm going to go to Cliff Gray, Paige Kreisman, Marsha Brewer, and Scott Smith. So if those folks could come up to the on deck, that would be great. Go ahead. Thank you. 
you. My name is Jackie McGee, and uh, my rent has always been increasing uh, more and more. Um, last year, my landlord let a two-bedroom apartment sit empty for nearly the whole year, yet he raised our rent quite a bit. And now there's a one-bedroom that's staying empty, and I believe that <coughs> if you could pass the House Bill 806, it would greatly be appreciated by me and other tenants. I also wanted to mention that when my son was young and he was going to school, I was able to pick houses in within the school zone that I can keep him in class. And I think it disrupts a lot of students' education, especially at a young age when people have to move and maybe possibly let the kids miss a lot of school. So that's another reason not to have the a no cause eviction. So thank you. My name is Peggy Catch. I'm here from Medford. I, drew, I got up this morning very early to drive all the way out here to tell you guys my bad story. So thank you very much for the time to share. I really appreciate it, Senator Fagan and all the rest of you. Thank you. The fact of the matter is I've only been in the state for a couple of years, and this is a new situation for me. My husband and I had an apartment in Medford that we rented, when, signed on scene, and we were happy to have it. And then it was sold. And when the new owners bought it, we were the first no-fault eviction. My neighbors and I inv investigated very carefully afterwards and found absolutely no reason. It was, a, it, it was a no fault. They didn't write any, re re any reason down. So we had to figure it out. Apparently, they wanted to rent our apartment to somebody else. We had paid, uh, paid our rent every month on time, sometimes a few days early, but we always paid on time without any questions or any problems. We were very good tenants. We never had made any problems at all, but we were just out because they decided they were going to rent it to somebody else. So not knowing what else to do, we just panicked. We went and we applied at every place that we could find in the newspapers in the, and online and whatever. We paid hundreds and hundreds of dollars in application fees to be very kindly told that we made it onto their list. We could be on their list for a year or two. How? Kind of them. Thank you very much. No housing was available at all. I hear today that it's 1% in Medford. I don't know what it was that day, but we went everywhere and couldn't find anything. I was very, very, I was very fortunate in a couple of places. I was fortunate that my husband had saved some savings so we could afford a deposit, a deposit at a new place when we did get one. I also found, had somebody I met at work who had a landlord with a, with a unit next to her, and she helped me get in. She hooked me up with the landlord who would actually rent. Thank you. Thank so you I was much. very fortunate because I was able to find a place and I was able to afford it. My husband was able to pull out a checkbook and write a $1,000 deposit sight unseen right now and pay it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank but you for your testimony. That was very limited and not helpful. I hear you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Fagan, Vice Chair Gerard, members of the committee. My name is Michelle Glass, and I live in Talent and am the director of the Rogue Action Center, a community-based organization in Southern Oregon working on housing affordability issues. Over the last year, we've knocked more than 2,200 doors across Jackson and Josephine counties to speak with renters about their experiences with housing. And by far, the top two issues we hear repeatedly across those regions are, is the devastating impact of no-cause evictions and repeated and unreasonable <coughs> rent hikes. SB 608 is a critical first step in addressing the instability in the rental market for the seniors, families, and working people that we speak with every day. Nearly half of the folks in my community rent their homes and one in three are paying more than 50% of income on housing costs. This leaves very little for other basic necessities such as food, prescriptions, or utilities. In fact, housing is recognized as such a, a driving uh, issue uh, impacting so many other parts of our community that it was just prioritized as the number two issue in our community health assessment by our coordinated care organizations and hospital systems for Jackson and Josephine counties. Some people question whether we need rent stabilization and just cause legislation. But if we've learned anything in the last two years since the legislature failed to act in 2017, it is that we cannot simply wait to build our way out of this crisis. We need action now, and we're counting on you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. 
The next panel is Paige Kreisman, Cliff Gray, Marsha Brewer, and Scott Smith. And on deck is Linda Lavelle, Sue Scott, Mary Mann, and Jessica Greenleaf. So if those four could please come to the on deck chairs, that would be great. <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, Chair Fagan, members of the committee, my name is Paige Kreisman. I'm co chair of Heart of the Valley Democratic Socialists of America in Corvallis. And I appreciate this bill. I uh, support it in its form, but I don't believe it goes far enough to protect tenants. So I'd like to address the members who are standing in the way of stronger amendments to this bill and ask you, who exactly do you think is protected by this? Uh, it doesn't protect me. I'm a disabled veteran, and my disability rate doesn't go up at 7% a year plus inflation. People on fixed incomes can't afford 7% a year. And this is expensive and inconvenient for me, but I'm single and live alone. For Oregon families, having to move every year, getting priced out of neighborhood after neighborhood uh, is, can be life shattering. And working class Oregonian families deserve to be able to grow a family and uh, build a home with the same dignity as, as property owners. So I'd like to ask you, if you're standing in the way of this bill, don't think we don't know how much money you're taking in from the landlord lobby and from the realtor lobby and ask yourself, who do you work for? Do you work for the people who vote for you or do you work for the people that sign your checks? Thank you. I hope I can say ditto to that. That covers a lot of ground I wanted to cover as well. but. Uh, I'm going to try another. Can you state your name for the record. My name is Cliff Gray. I represent uh, uh, Rent Control Now, Oregon. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to try something here which may balance uh, the whole issue of landlord expenses. Oregon needs a reality check. Uh, rents here are twice what they should be relative to property values with, with many other states. Now, I'm going to compare here. I'm going to compare here San Francisco, where I've lived for 40 years, uh, with Portland and Eugene, those two that I know. Anyway, the average rents in San Francisco is a little more than 2500 per month. That includes both rent control uh, properties, 60% of the total, and uncontrolled current outlay of payments. It's very different from uh, the internet statements of new listings. So if you move there, you got to go to the new listing. But this is what they pay out now. That includes. Oh, gee. The, the average SF home goes for $1,444,650. So properties are very high, six times the national average, or I estimate five times that of Oregon cities. Very much retest. We're, we just, there's lots of people that want to be heard, so we want to make sure everybody gets to be heard. So I appreciate everybody really trying to keep to the 90 seconds. Go ahead. Thank you, committee members, for listening to our testimonies. This is a desperate crisis situation. I'm Marsha Breuer. I'm one of, of too many in our state who are facing chronic housing instability. I am on Social Security and will be paying more than half, almost three quarters of the money that I'm taking in, uh, ev and uh, my rent increases every year. Um, and even though I'm on Section 8 housing, I'm getting no relief. A 7 percent, 4 percent, or even a 1 percent increase every year is too much. I can't can't sustain that, uh, and and I'm just hoping that there are some kind of exemptions for uh, marginalized, for disability, for people that are facing almost being in the street. Um, 
uh, I, I won't be able to sustain this for much longer. This is the way we are being no cause forced out of shelter of our homes. I have lived in my apartment for 24 years, and I have and I've seen the changing of the guard landlords of, of my complex. The rents were almost doubled several years ago, and of the 15 unit properties, um, everyone was forced out except one of my neighbors who could weather the increase because of a good paying job and myself because I fought long and hard struggling and miraculously received Section 8 housing. I don't know how that happened, but I got it. Um, I'm one of the few of, few of the lucky ones. Um, as renters, uh, we feel like commodities and we deserve a better way. We need stronger protections. This uh, 608, I'm for it, but it's just a tiny puzzle piece of what we have. Oh man, I've got, um, I just want to ask you, what does it feel like to be a homeless con Turn the alarm off. Excuse Kenny, me. I run the committee, sir, and we there's a hundred people that want to be heard. So we're asking folks to cut their committee their their testimony short. People Senator were ignoring the people were ignoring the alarm when we only played it a couple of times. So we have a lot of people who want to be heard, and thank you for for letting me run the committee. Thank you. Senator Fagan, can I just... Yes, you can, quickly, um, please. I, I, I just am asking um, to be in a desperate panic at 3 a.m. at night, too many nights and too many days, the distress of always worrying, the terrible toll it is taking all of our spirits, all of our souls. What does it What does it look like if you are one of the on the precipice of constant uncertainty? Uh, uh, having a job or position are no guarantees that you will not be facing a crisis Thank at Thank you some very point. much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And you can all, just so you know, you can all submit written testimony as well. And I know it's hard to keep to 90 seconds. Trust me, I'm a fast talker, so I know that. But we really want to give everybody an opportunity to be heard before 10 o'clock tonight. So we really want to get out of here. So I appreciate your, your respecting the 90 seconds. Uh, the next panel is Linda Lavelle, Sue Scott, Mary Mann, and Jessica Greenleaf. And on deck is Jeff Riddle, Anna Blackman, Anna Penna, and Robert, Robert Hagelberg. And as of my notes, that's Robert is the last person who traveled for more than 100 miles who has not been heard yet tonight. If you did travel for 100 miles but you haven't testified yet, please do send a slip to the committee staff because we want to make sure that you can get out of here quickly. But under the notes, that's the, the last person I have who traveled 100 miles or more. So thank you. Begin. Laval, I'm asking you to vote no on Senate Bill 608. Please research how hard it is to remove bad residents from with no cause notice. This notice can co can cost me between six and seven hundred dollars to have my attorneys write it each and every time. Um, you have attempted to make some exceptions to the prohibition on no cause notices, but you have missed many that you have not considered. For example, what happens if a housing provider is dying, has no money, they are moving out of state for a job or military, and all we can sell is owner occupied with 120 uh, days res um, note to the residents. The housing provider has passed away, and the estate has to sell the property or properties. The termination is required by federal law. So you have the low-income housing tax credit, home laws, Section 8 laws, eminent do domain issues, unauthorized occupants. These are just a few things that, that can come up. Housing providers are not in the business of removing t residents. Housing providers don't want bad residents, and other residents don't want bad residents living close to them. No cause notices are used to remove bad tenants. Um, Rate, rent stabilization. Rent control reduces supply, which leads to higher rent and subpar housing. Developers will build in other states, and the short supply of housing will continue along with other problems associated with it. Short-term solutions. Airbnbs have taken rental units off the market. Look at how to reduce or eliminate it. And I got a bunch more. Thank you. And I do encourage you to submit that. We do read the written testimony. Thank you for taking the time to come. Go ahead. Um, all right. Hello, my name is Sue Scott. I'm a uh, researcher and uh, consultant in the healthcare industry, also a landlord. And I would say that I guess one thing I haven't heard mentioned here is there's no income targets on these uh, on this rent law, so that people who are making uh, a vast amount of money could get one of these rent control departments and keep that. So that seems like one thing that should be uh, noticed, as well as my colleagues, some of those things that she mentioned that should be considered in the in the just cause or no cause concerns. Overall, I don't think that um, 
the rent control or rent stabilization, anywhere that's been tried has worked. It does result in uh, higher rents and less and less product. It's, so it's not an evidence-based thing that we're going for in this this Senate bill. I think there's a lot of things about the that the the Senate bill that I like, but uh, at least those couple of things I think need a little more consideration and a little more work. I think that the input that the committees had should be more broad-based. There should be more people from both sides of, of the issues that should be listened to, and that uh, exemptions for the poor that might be subsidized by the counties or cities. I live in the city of Portland, and our hands are tied already without this, and it just makes it really hard to run a good building with all of these um, parts to it. Our legal costs go up now because all of these notices are expensive to be served, and that's another aspect that adds to our cost. And just our taxes, insurance, and reserves are over 50, 60 percent of our income. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Fagan and committee. My name is Mary Mann. I'm a homeowner. I'm a rental property owner, a single mom, our former renter, former eight-year city councilor, a general contractor of almost 40 years. I've weatherized thousands of rental properties and private homes. And I have a 69-year-old brother who is homeless on the streets of Winchester, Virginia, so I understand what's going on. He used to be a social services planner affiliate with United Way. I think we need to cut to the chase. This is really about class warfare. This is about the haves and the have-nots and pitting landlords against tenants. And it's very grossly unfair because we've had a great relationship over these last 70 years. I'm part of the Rental Housing Alliance. And this is not our problem. And everyone wants to think that because the rents go up, it's all because of the big bad landlords. Well, NPR profiled a 70-unit apartment complex in Portland that was sold. And those tenants were given uh, notice that that place had to be vacated. Half of the elementary school next to it was vacated. This place was substandard housing, and these tenants paid 50% under the current market housing to live in disgusting situations. Developers come in, they bring it up to standard housing, they save housing stock that was built in the 70s that if they weren't doing something in 10 or 20 years, would be torn down and built into condominiums. They should be applauded for this. There are other solutions to this, and nobody pays my Medicare incentive that uh, supplement that just went up 9% this year, or automobile bills. You're putting it on the wrong group of people. If the state wants to support it, they need to subsidize landlords, subsidize the tenants. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Committee members, thank you so much for hearing from me today. My name is Jessica Greenlee, and I am a renter in Portland, and I also work for Affinity Property Management in the multifamily housing industry. I understand a lot of the perspectives of individuals who've been testifying before you today and that affordable housing is needed. However, I am opposed to SB 608 partially because it does detract from the actual solution, which is a continued public investment in the production and operation of affordable housing. You can't replace the $700 rents that are gone from before. In fact, SB 608 unfortunately promotes a situation where there's a long-term deterioration of the housing stock, especially if you look at projections five, seven, and 10 years out. However, I know that this is a time period where we have to look for a multitude of solutions. Um, that being said, in looking at the language of the bill, I would really like to see definitions for the words occupancy and tenancy placed in that. And the amendment specifically removing the emergency clause would help it better provide continuity with the existing laws in place, specifically regarding notice time periods that are required. And I think that's an important aspect to look at this legislation if you choose to move forward with implementing it. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. The next panel, Jeff Riddle, Anna Blackman, Anna Penna, and Robert Hagelberg. And on deck is Emily Ryman, Austin Folegni, Joel Matson, and Rebecca Wagnon. Hi. Um, My name is Jeff Riddle. Uh, thank you for having us today. Um, Dear State Representatives, my name is Jeff Riddle and I'm the Income Development Manager at Transition Projects 
and a Portland resident. Uh, here at Transition Projects, we focus on assisting folks in their homelessness and help them attain housing. While working at Transition Projects, I've had the liberty to cross many individual paths. These people range from mothers to fathers, sons and daughters, and very high-end professionals who've had something disastrous happen to them um, and place them in a situation where they need to access services with us. One thing that I've researched is that for people who have uh, housing, moving is a top stressor. Imagine this as a person who is experiencing homelessness, they move all the time. The level of stress they have to endure is insane. Functioning at such high levels of stress will eventually create a breaking point for someone and there are then potential disaster could happen. That disaster could be drug use, risky behavior, or even suicide. During my time with Transition Projects, um, I've actually come close to experiencing homelessness once again, uh, this time to no fault of my own. Um, the owner of the home decided that they wanted the property back uh, after seeking an appraisal and uh, we improved that property. Uh, th this left me and my family of seven uh, to make a decision that we didn't want to. We ended up taking a place um, that we currently rent from where the rent was raised to $2,100 from 1950 and the original considered uh, original debt or rent was considered to be $1,650 for rent reasonable. Uh, obviously, this is a big difference and it comes down to pricing. I'm now working on purchasing a home, but um, I don't have to deal with landlords gouging me and my hard-earned money. Um, one thing that I do want to kind of finish up and say is that there have been studies that have mentioned the importance of having stability growing up and uh, now my children don't have to face that any longer. Um, I do appreciate your time today, and I am here and looking to have your support for SB 608. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Anna. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Fagan and members of the committee. My name is Anna Blackman. I've been a CNA at Sacred Heart Medical Center in Springfield for almost 14 years and a proud member of SEA Local 49 for almost four. My family is committed to having a healthy and safe Springfield, and that's why I support SB 608. Housing is a key part of people's health and safety. I see what happens to people who come into the hospital who don't have a place to live. Their health is in jeopardy, and the Oregon legislature can help some people have a little more security as they should. Right now, like many of my patients, I don't have the stability of a home. Um, I am a renter and I have received three no-cause evictions in five years. The worst <laughs> was a landlord pocketing our $1,600 rent payments and not making his house payments. We only found out through a foreclosure notice on the door. Um, we started moving and had the locks changed and remainder of belongings removed. Um, I cannot ever replace my great-grandmother's vanity. It was irreplaceable. Um, we found a local small landlord in Springfield who was willing to do some trading of work around the house. I had no idea that after a year, once again, we would be moving. After being one day late on our rent over the President's Day holiday because of our inability to mail a money order, our landlord char charged us a $150 late fee. We paid the fee and thought that would be the end of it. We paid our rent on time. We were good tenants. We were doing projects around the house, including a fence that she backed out on paying us. Shortly after that, we received yet another no cause eviction. Once again, our whole lives were rocked. Just like the patients I see every day, I no longer had the stability of a home. Um, I would just like to say that my husband and I have chose not to rent any longer. We bought a 30-foot trailer to live in for the last year and a half until we can afford our own home. I really hope that you will support uh, passing Housing Bill uh, SB 608. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, Good afternoon, uh, Chair Fagan and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Ana Pena, and I'm currently a senior at the University of Oregon and a full-time employee at a behavioral therapies and addiction services nonprofit. Um, through my work and personal experience, I know that housing gives people an opportunity to live better lives, and to succeed, everyone needs a safe place to call home. In Lane County, one out of every three renters is spending over 50% of their income, income on rent, and I am one of them. My number one dream growing up was to attend college in Oregon, and I made that come true by moving to Eugene in 2015. However, I quickly experienced obstacles when attempting to rent a place. From 2015 to 2017, I lived with four other roommates and was still barely able to afford my rent. During this time, I struggled to make ends meet and began working over 40 hours while being a full-time student to have safe housing. Three months later, my rental developed a serious black mold infestation that was affecting the health of my roommates and myself. Uh, when we mentioned it to our rental company, we did not receive any assistance and the mold only continued to grow. As a student, I felt vulnerable, helpless, and exhausted. 
I was forced to miss class just to meet work obligations to afford rent and put food on the table. I did not have any support to rectify an unhealthy living situ situation or the ability to find new housing until I was forced to due to a 20% rent increase. Ultimately, housing insecurity has been one of the biggest setbacks for my education and personal health. However, I know that I'm still a lucky case. At my workplace, I see the severe effects of housing instability on addiction and behavioral health. And that's why people who rent their homes like me are depending on the legislator to act to provide basic protections and stability. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Harrison at Hackleburg. My name is Robert Harrison. Briefly stated, I live in Medford. The building I live in was bought a couple of years ago by an investment company in Portland, or a realty company in Portland, with an investment company attached to it. And they have since been gentrifying the building. Their idea of a profile tenant is a younger, higher income tenant which is displacing a lot of the older tenants who have been there for a long time. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Thank Please you support SB 604. 608. Thank you so 608. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next panel will come up from the on-deck chairs. And then our next uh, panel will be Dan Hayes. Diane Cassidy, Joy Valeen, and Eric Fruits. Yeah. And Vice Chair Gerard, members of the committee, uh, for the record, my name is Joel Madsen. Uh, I'm here today as president of the association or the Housing Authorities of Oregon, a uh, membership association comprised of 22 public housing authorities across the state of Oregon. So our members promote and administer affordable housing solutions in each county throughout the state. Together, we're the largest affordable housing providers in the state, and we receive federal funds from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to distribute housing choice or Section 8 vouchers. <coughs> we operate in every county of the state, as I mentioned, and provide rental assistance vouchers on behalf of nearly 34,000 households, uh, a true public-private partnership. In addition, some public housing authorities, such as the one that I direct in the Gorge, build, own, and operate affordable housing for seniors, people with disabilities, and people with the lowest incomes in our communities. I'm pleased to be here this evening to express our association's support for this bill. And I want to highlight a few reasons for this support uh, of the bill. Over the past several years, we have seen people with housing choice vouchers get significant rent increases which has had, had impacted their ability to stay in the units where they were utilizing that voucher. Those of us who own uh, either own public housing or affordable housing um, operate and have been operating without using no-cause evictions. And we are able to successfully and sustainably manage our por portfolio in doing so. Housing instability has huge and negative consequences on our families, seniors, and the people we serve. We urge you to support Senate Bill 608, and our membership supports that. Thank, Thank you. you. Chair Fagan, members of the committee, my name is Emily Ryman, and I'm here in support of Senate Bill 608 in two capacities today. The first is as, as CEO of Willamette Neighborhood Housing and NEDCO, two strong affordable housing agencies that recently merged. The second is as a private landlord of two rental units that I own here in Salem. As CEO of Willamette Neighborhood and NEDCO, we see every day the impact of our housing crisis and skyrocketing rents across Oregon. As a mission-driven landlord, we've also successfully managed almost 400 units of housing following the very provisions required by 608. Affordable housing is also a business, and our projects also have to pencil, and we can do so with modest rent increases and for-cause evictions. As a private landlord, I count myself lucky to own a rental property that offers me income and will become a long-term asset in retirement, but I understand that the business model of that rental housing is based on somebody's need for housing. To a large extent, I control that person's access to a roof over their head, I control whether their kids can stay stably in the same school, and I think it's entirely reasonable to ask me as a landlord to moderate my business decisions with the human impact of those decisions. It's reasonable to ask me to make moderate small rent increases each year rather than delaying maintenance and causing rent hikes or exorbitant rent in increases in a given year. I can absolutely manage my properties to make them pencil within the provisions of Senate Bill 608, and I urge you to pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Fagan and members of the committee. 
I live in Shady Cove, Jackson County, and I work in Medford. I raised a hard working and successful son who lives in Beaverton and have no other family in Oregon. I'm a member of SEIU 49, and after leaving an abusive marriage, I moved from Joseph Can you state your name for the record? Sorry. Oh, Becca Wagnon. Rebecca Wagnon. Should I start over or? No. After leaving an abusive marriage, I moved from Josephine County to Jackson County in 2008 in order to feel safe. And I took what I could find, a low paying job, which was, which I could pay for housing and expenses. I rented for nine years, never late, and a good caretaker. About a year ago, I received a 30 don day notice saying the house had sold. It's hard to find a place in 30 days. There's a lack of housing. And I discovered rents had doubled and income had barely increased. I inquired with all available resources and I, I could find and found there was no help for my demographic, old, working, and single. I ended up moving to Shady Cove because it was the closest place I could feel safe. I now have to drive 35, out, 35 minutes to work and I only hope that my 2002 car has no major issues. I think the housing rates in Jackson County changed so quickly with the lack of housing and low incomes. There are so many people in Jackson County finding themselves in desperate situations. I am hoping that Senate Bill 608 will pass so we can preserve dignity and security for ordinary people so that decent, hardworking Oregonians can find a safe and afford a place to, affordable place to live. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, honorable members of the committee, my name is Austin Fulmigy. I'm the uh, property manager for Mudjar Property Management in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Drove a long ways to be here, so I appreciate the time for me to speak here today. Altogether, um, I support uh, Senate Bill 608 because I believe it gives tenants the rights and the respect that I feel that they deserve. And also, I think our industry as housing providers will be better because of it. Overall, um, my business is not going to be impacted if we get rid of no cause eviction. And if we just even put aside like the business model, the you know profit margins and so forth, when is it okay not to have due process? Due process is something that we believe in both as a people and a nation. And without it, it's not just and it's not fair. And altogether, I think that the, with the exceptions that are in place, this will still allow for um, small scale investors and also um, owner occupied rentals to still continue and to prosper in this uh, state. And I believe that uh, real estate investors will still continue to grow the housing supply that's available in uh, the state of Oregon as well on top of that. And the way I look at it is my tenants are my customers. It is my responsibility to provide a good product, good customer service, which means that if there's a reason that they're going to be evicted, I better give them a reason and a cause for that eviction, not tell them no reason and not give them a way to cure that, uh, uh, that eviction. So with that in mind, I feel this will create stable communities and more importantly, stable families. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next panel, and on deck, we have Tareed Kaloub. I'm butchering that as in as a Shamia. I'm sorry for butchering that. So, and from, that's from Unite, uh, Unite Oregon. Jennifer Aviles, Sarah Spansale, and Mark, I think it looks like K-N-E-H-T. Knudsen, thank you. Oh, I got it, okay. Pastor Mark, got it, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Dan Hayes. I'm a native Oregonian, rental property owner, and somebody who manages hundreds of rental units across the uh, Portland metro market. I'm asking you to uh, vote no for Senate Bill 608. I stand here in opposition, not because it's not a workable solution or the intent of the, of the bill isn't right, but because it will actually do very little to create the environment in which you intend. Uh, keep the no-cause eviction uh, a, a limit on it, uh, I think, um, Landlords that uh, use a no-cause eviction as a way to enforce a lease uh, is absolutely the wrong thing to do. In fact, while you're at it, why don't you add some education requirements uh, for us landlords. Uh, but rent control does not work. I know a little something about pricing in a past career, and when you fix pricing, <coughs> you have a tendency to fix pricing. Uh, and my phone is literally ringing off the hook with landlords that are so frustrated with the process that they don't want to go through the complexity. Uh, that's going to be about an 8 to 10 percent increase in their cost, which is going to be passed on to tenants. Uh, additionally, uh, the, the restrictions on, on some of the uh, uh, screening that's up coming down the pike, I think, will also increase the cost. Uh, and in fact, I think what you're going to end up with is a fairly standard rent increase of 7 plus CPI each year 
every year and in fact will have the opposite effect of what you intend. Uh, as such, I am in opposition of House Bill 608 because it does very little to actually solve the problem which you're trying to solve. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Fagan. How are you doing? We need you on the show some Sunday. Okay. Um, committee members, I, I'm Eric Fruits, a Cascade Policy Institute Research Director and also Faculty Fellow at Portland State University where I edit their real estate journal, which is coming out this month. Um, you know, just as, as a matter of first principles, economists are not big fans of rent control. I know we like to distinguish this rent control, which we call second generation from the first generation of rent control, which we know has created shortages and made uh, buildings uh, worse off and people worse off. But thinking that second generation rent control is somehow different, it's really just a matter of degrees. It's kind of like a second degree burn is better than a third degree burn. A second degree rent control is uh, just a little bit better than first degree rent control. And that's really borne out by a lot of the testimony that's been here. For example, uh, Dr. Barton noted something or didn't note something, and no one who's testified has noted this. Not a single new unit will be created with this rent control. In fact, Mr. Barton admitted that there will be fewer units. In other words, we will create a shortage. It won't be as bad as under first generation, but there will be shorter unit, fewer units. And that's been, I was borne out by the woman who sat next to me in an earlier panel from Medford who was upset about not being able to find an apartment. We're focusing so much on the, the tenancy terminations where we aren't really focusing on how hard it is for people to actually find units, that there's such a shortage of units and this does nothing to help that shortage. Oh, thank you. My name is Diane Cassidy. Uh, rent control results in less housing, not more, and exacerbates the imbalance between demand and supply when only increased supply will bring costs down. When income is capped, housing providers do not continue in a business that does not allow them to maximize their investment. Rent control allows one party, the renters, to get a benefit at the expense of the other party, the owner but only the burdened owner carries the risk and responsibilities of providing the benefit to the renter. Rent control and rent stabilization transfers the value of one person's work to another. One person's income becomes the other's subsidy. This forced wealth distribution is theft of property by government fiat. As a rental housing owner, my personal income is at stake, but there is no limit to the income a renter can make. This is a one-way deal where government makes the rules, picks the winners, punishes the losers, pitting one side against the other. Why vilify just landlords? Why not producers and sellers of other necessary goods and services? Why not limit the prices for groceries, cap the price of new and used cars, put a limit on what doctors can make? Goods and services would dry up as valued workers and businesses quit or went elsewhere. So it is with housing providers. Society needs us, but who would want to be a landlord in such a punitive regulatory environment? Thank you. My name is Joy Belline. I have 40 years experience of working for a private landlord. I'm arguing against the elimination of no cause termination notices after one year of a tenant's residency. On paper, this sounds fair and wonderful the reality can be something different. A renter is entitled to the peaceful enjoyment of the rental property, but if a tenant who has a, has a neighbor who is harassing, intimidating, or even threatening, that bad actor needs to go. Going through the process of a four-cause notice, the landlord may have to uh, move forward to eviction, and it is very likely the testimony about the good resident is going to be needed for the landlord to prevail. Someone who is already afraid of their neighbor is unlikely to appear to give testimony at the court hearing. The good resident is probably not going to feel comfortable or safe in his home if the bad actor wins at court and doesn't have to move. This is why the ability to give a no-cause termination notice needs to be preserved, even if the rental housing provider has to make a reasonable payment, as is currently the case in Portland. I implore you not to eliminate the ability of a rental housing provider to give a no-cause termination notice. Thank you very much. And Pastor Mark, I actually think you're in the going to be on, you're going to be on deck now. So there actually is a Mark. Is it Can Canute? Yes. Okay, come on up. So I think that he. Yeah. So you're on deck this time. And so the next panel will come up, and then on deck is Pastor Mark, Tammy Klein, 
Janice or Janine Weir and Emily Ruggle. <coughs> <laughs> Hello, Chair Fagan, Vice Chair Gerard, and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Spansale. I'm a tenant leader in Southern Oregon, and as a member of the Southern Oregon Tenants Union and the Tenant Leadership Council of the Community Alliance of Tenants, I drove the 200 miles to be here in support of Senate Bill 608. In the many tenant meetings I've participated in, I've heard dozens of stories from community members who have struggled in the past several years with 40% and higher rent increases as well as an abundance of no cause evictions. Had Senate Bill 608 been law already, these community members wouldn't have faced houselessness, financial struggle, and the many anxieties for which for the future of their families. Passing this bill will have immediate positive impacts for tenants across our state, but particularly in our more rural areas where the economy has made low-income folks more vulnerable. Please support this bill <laughs> to ease the struggles of tenants like myself and others who need immediate relief from outrageous rental increases and no cause evictions in our state. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dagreed. I'm from Bend, Oregon. And you need to say your last name too. Thank Dagreed you. Dagreed Chalou. Thank you. I'm writing to urge your support for this bill 608 and increased protections against unjust eviction and economic displace, uh, displacement for the 40% of Oregon households that rent their homes. I have an example about my mother. So my mother uh, rented in Beaverton uh, apartment uh, for six years. She's a disabled woman. And uh, because of her uh, vulnerability, uh, she was uh, threatened and uh, humiliated and discriminated against by building manager. And if she called police, he would uh, expel her. Uh, and uh, when uh, there no place uh, to uh, stand her um, medical transportation, when she complained about this one, he just threatened her to make her move only because she uh, requests uh, her, her right for her right in the building. So uh, just I am um, wondering and I'm asked and I hope for all, um, I hope all tenants in Oregon get help by passing um, the, this bill 608. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. Sorry. Hello, Chairperson um, Fagan, Vice Chairperson Gerard, and the rest of the Senate Housing Committee. My name is Jennifer Aviles, and I reside in Grants Pass, Oregon. I traveled hundreds of miles through the snow to demonstrate my support of SB 608. While not perfect, SB 608 puts forth basic protections for those who rent, and those who rent are no small group. According to the census in my city, that group accounts for 50% of the people who live there. Um, we have a population of about 37,000, so that's a lot of people. Um, in my county, um, that shifts to about 60-40 uh, owner-occupied to renters. According to Oregon's Housing and Community Services, in my city, those who rent one-third pay more than 30% of their income to housing, and in my county, uh, one in three pay over 50% of their income to housing. I volunteer for a local nonprofit that's currently um, working a housing campaign, and I knock on doors and I clipboard at local events. I've heard numerous stories of people who are unable to secure housing or who have been evicted due to no cause of their own and are currently living in hotels, uh, campers, trailers. They camp even when the weather is not, I mean, they're camping now. Um, I live in a community that does not have a warming center. It has only one shelter. And so housing is a fundamental infrastructure need that is not currently being met. Again, I don't think SB 608 is perfect, but I do think that it's the first step to providing some protections to a group that um, is large. Thank you. Yes, my name is Mark Kinnick, and I live here in Salem, and I do a lot of advocacy work for veterans and people with disabilities, and you all have a handout, and I've done a lot of research here, and I'm a veteran myself, and it is a crying shame here in the state of Oregon alone. 
We've got 1,300 homeless veterans, and nationwide, we've got 38,000, and that is a crying shame. America can do better than that for veterans. And then also, um, I did a thing on hunger uh, in the Capitol Press this fall. Uh, between hunger and homelessness, it's a big problem in this area, and you have a nice handout here, and I went to a lot of time, time and trouble, and you know, the little raise we got in Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid is no gonna more than eat that up. And yet our, and yet the rent keeps going up and stuff, you know, I mean, uh, with just the raise we got in Social Security, we haven't gained a thing there, there because Medicare, Medicaid's gonna no more need that up. And, and also, uh, uh, like food stamps, for instance, okay, um, they base that on our income, and that should not be counted against our income. Come so um, uh, we get, I get heating assistance, and they should offset that because of the uh, in the winter time. They should offset that and give us a little more in food stamps. Well, I that's six dollars. I don't have either way. So anyway, you have a nice testimony here, and I put in some things from the city and what Governor Brown has proposed for her budget, and I thank you very much for your time allowing me to testify this Thank afternoon. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the on-deck panel is up, and the panel that will now be on deck is Jerry Mason, John DiLorenzo, Sean Jillians, and Sammy Yoon. Chair Fagan and Chair Fagan and members of the committee, my name is Emily Ruggles. I teach Spanish at Westview High School, and I previously taught at Five Oaks Middle School, a Title I school in Beaverton. At Five Oaks, newly arriving students were scared to trust me, exhausted from the stress of moving um, and grieving the loss of their friend groups. They often struggled academically because the world language classroom requires sequencing of curriculum most often um, to be successful. And being forced to change schools because of yet another move just didn't cause stress, exhaustion, and social isolation. It just it disrupted their education. Students who move frequently do so because their parents cannot make rent and are often evicted. As an educator, nothing is worse than the realization that a need as simple as stable housing isn't being met and that you've reached the limit on what you can do to help your students succeed. More than any other students, those affected by the housing crisis need to build on academic victories, strengthen the few friendships that they have at their new schools, and maintain relationships with adults who have finally earned their trust because that process takes a lot of time and it's a huge victory when it happens. The most vulnerable among us are students impacted by the lack of affordable housing and this is happening on our watch. Um, I've seen firsthand in the world language classroom how much potential our schools, communities, and our state are squandering when we allow students to struggle because of something as basic as having a safe and consistent place to call home. There's power in this room to change that, and I encourage you all to, to use it by advancing SB 608. Thank you. Chair Fagan and members of the committee, my name is Tamara Klein with the Oregon Nurses Association, and I'm here to support the Senate Bill 608. I live in a smaller community in eastern Oregon where a large percent of that population is below or at poverty levels. I live with friends, patients, and family members that are charged $800 to $1,000 for a one-bedroom apartment. When that um, cost becomes unsustainable for them, the tenants are forced to move out, and we live in a community that has one rental company that rents out approximately 95% of all rentals. They've been known to raise the rent 200 to $500 for the next tenant moving in. Every week I look at the newspaper and see multiple people looking for rentals with absolutely no place to go. My daughter lived in a rental in the Pendleton area. It had been so old that it should have been condemned years ago. This rental had holes in the ceiling that she was catching water with pans. The sills on the windows were not there. There was black mold on the walls and there was no lock on the door. When she went to the um, manager to address these situations, she was threatened with eviction. Every week, this is happening continually in our community. This is why I'm supporting Bill 608. In communities from Portland to Pendleton, affordable and stable housing is an issue that has too long been ignored. I am tired of seeing my patients come into the hospital with asthma due to this black mold. I am tired of seeing these patients spend over 30 days in my hospital because they have absolutely no home to go home to.
I see people in my community to make the tough choice every single day of whether they are able to afford their rent or whether they are able to put food on their table and now they are living on the streets. We strongly support this bill. Chair Fagan and members of the committee. My name is Janine Weir and I have been an educator working on behalf of struggling students and families for 19 years in Beaverton School District. My colleagues and I created a program to re-engage students, a successful program that for students who experience an interruption in their education. My current role is high school success, coordination and development, so where we continue to develop and expand the programs available for our students' success. Though we work tirelessly to provide the best education possible with the resources we have, 32% of the students coming to our re-engagement services have reported that they have either had interrupted living situations or unstable housing or homeless. As of November 2018, my, in my district alone, we have a total of 1,238 children from birth to 12th grade who are either homeless or in temporary housing. If we believe that these are not the children of working families, we would be mistaken. These are our families who are working in our community and they are part of the 40 percent of Oregonians who need Senate Bill 608 to protect their homes and the stability of their families. They are the children who stand, the, who stand to gain the most from re-engagement services and investments the state and district have made in career and technical education and other programs. At the very high school where our re-engagement program lives, I'm currently working directly with industry partners and the state to create a construction tech CTE magnet program for our district. And our opportunity to help the students with programs like these to succeed is difficult to maximize with unstable housing. Our students need a place to study, read, eat, and sleep at night. I urge you to take action. Uh, Chair Fagan and members of the Senate Housing Committee, my name is Reverend W.J. Mark Knudsen, Senior Pastor of Augustana Lutheran Church in Northeast Portland for the last 23 years past president of Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, past chair of the Northwest Health Foundation Board as well. This is all part of a whole, as you know. Uh, in a state with tremendous resources, we have a lot of people who are hurting, and we are in crisis. And we keep all of you in our prayers every day because you put yourselves on the line to serve publicly as you do. So thank you for your service. We are in a crisis in Oregon, um, and I speak in strong support of Senate Bill 608 because it's a step in the right direction for our most vulnerable citizens. And as faith leaders in the state, we judge our state and how we're doing, uh, not by how the best things are going, but how the most vulnerable are doing. And that's how we judge this nation. Augustana is home of a, the Augustana Center for Systemic Change. It includes six nonprofits. We're a thriving multicultural, multinational sanctuary congregation. But our six nonprofits do two and a half million dollars worth of justice work on one little corner in Portland, Oregon. Included in that collaborative is the Community Alliance of Tenants, who has taken a strong role in this, and we cheer them on. We know the hardest thing to do when people come to churches, we have 40,000 visits outside of worship every year, and the hardest thing People come to synagogues, our temples, our mosques, our churches when they're in points of crisis, when all hope seems gone. And to sit with the family and help to put a Band-Aid to get them through when little children are worried about going to school the next day and where they're going to sleep is a very difficult thing. And so we know we can take those public actions to change systems and laws that make this state livable for all. And let's raise the bar for every Oregonian to have all that they need in terms of housing, health, food, employment, and education. Thank you for your great work. Thank you. All right. The next panel. Thank you. Eileen Maxfield, did you want to come up with this panel as well? It looks like only three of them were here anyway. So you trying to avoid a meter feed over here. So come on up. Right here. Thank sure. you very much. Sure. <coughs> Appreciate being included. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Center uh, Committee. Uh, my name is Jerry Mason. I'm apartment owner in Portland. <coughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to pause you right there, and we'll, and we'll start your time over. I just want to make sure that we get the next on deck and stay efficient. So the next on deck is Letitia Wilson, Britt Conroy, uh, Elaine Friesen Strange, and Michelle Glass. That's the next on deck. Go ahead, and we'll start your time over. Thank you. I, uh, I'm an apartment owner in Portland, and uh, there's no doubt that we've got one devil of a housing crisis. 
Um, we're dealing with, but we're dealing with two different elements of it. We're dealing with a part that can't afford uh, the, how, the, the, the income to pay, pay the kind of rents and so on that are going on. We've got another part that is just meet low, and medium, low and medium income people who are just struggling with, with medium priced housing apartments. The issue is really supply. If you can't, we can't legislate enough to create affordable housing. We have to have uh, competition. And that, otherwise the government ends up uh, doing it with their tax dollars that could be spent elsewhere. So just some numbers that, that uh, I haven't heard anything about. Uh, through the uh, multifamily uh, uh, apartment report, these numbers come uh, over th the last 13 years. The average annual rent increase has been 7.2 percent. Between the years 2000, uh, fall of 2015 and 2016, the rent increases were 10.5 percent. Years 16 and 17, they were 6.8 percent rent increases. Years 2017 to 18, they were 3.2 percent. Now this is talking about Portland, Vancouver. So. The supply is coming in, it's affecting, uh, getting closer to demand, which can hold back uh, hold these, these owners and rent increases in, in, in tow. It's a supply issue, pure and simple. Thank you very much. I appreciate you getting me on this panel. Um, my name is Eileen Maxfield, I'm from the Philomath area. I'm neutral on this bill. There's a lot of good things in it. There are some real headaches in it. Um, my family is a owner, manager for uh, six units, four properties. I totally agree with what I've heard, that we have a housing issue. I don't think this bill is going to handle it, but I am a really applauding the legislative process that has gotten something that isn't going to be a killer for landlords and yet is also going to give some security for tenants. I don't know how we can address some of the in economic and employment issues that is a large part of this issue and the one question that I have on this is how do landlords deal with the question of if I'm handing over one month's worth of rent when I give notice and the tenant is PO'd about it they have 90 days to trash my place and I'm going to have, I may have recourse under law, but the reality is I'm not going to ever see that money. And, and I, you know, most tenants are excellent. Most landlords don't raise their rents unreasonably. I think this is a good compromise. And go ahead and pass it, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Fagan and members. I'm John DiLorenzo. I'm a partner with law firm of Davis Wright Germain. I'm appearing here on behalf of More Housing Now. Uh, we share the views of most economists that rent caps combined with ineffective strategies for expansion of supply lead to significant increases in the cost of whatever housing units are exempt from the caps. Uh, but even if we supported the concept behind this bill, the bill as written is unworkable. I think the amendments before you illustrate the problems that should be addressed. First, the emergency clause will cause havoc. A sudden change in the law with no warning will create a trap for the unwary and subject the uninformed to huge penalties. The Dash 1 amendment addresses that. Number two, the bill creates no exemption for major infrastructure repairs, roof repairs, or seismic retrofitting. Anyone who thinks that the caps in this bill provide adequate room for amortizing capital improvements of this magnitude have never had experience financing them. The Dash 2 amendments address that. Number three, the bill disrupts the condominium industry. The Dash 3s address that. And number four, the bill permits local jurisdictions to pile on top of the bill's one-month relocation provisions. So Portland, Multnomah County, and other jurisdictions could all adopt their own relocation fees and pile on top of those. The Dash 5 amendments address that. Thank you for an opportunity to point out the uh, 
I mean, like a pro. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, Sean Jillians, representing the Oregon Association of Realtors in opposition to Senate Bill 608. Uh, I think we've heard a lot of uh, both sides talking about the supply issue. I hope that when we talk about that, we're serious this session about addressing it. Our land use system severely restricts supply as it is, and now we're further uh, enacting policies that will restrict investment in the state and housing units. I used to make the comment that economists universally agree that rent control doesn't work, except for that there was one economist in Berkeley that did disagree with that. It was a pleasure to meet Dr. Barton today, uh, who came up. Uh, the things that I wanted to touch briefly on the other amendments that were in OLIS right now, the Dash 4 amendment deals with an issue that we had negotiated through the Landlord-Tenant Coalition some years ago. It's for sale properties where the owner who's purchasing intends to <laughs> occupy the property. We have a shorter timeline there due to lending requirements and actually taking possession of the property when a good faith purchaser wants to do it. It was a very limited circumstance for folks who are good faith purchasers who wanted to move in the home immediately that they purchased. And in order to close the transaction, they needed to take that possession. That was, uh, taken away in this legislation. Um, I would close, Madam Chair, in the final 10 seconds. I've been doing this for 15 years. I've been involved in every major housing policy discussion in this building during that time. This time we were excluded from the conversation and I think that's too bad. We could have help, hopefully made a better bill for you. Next panel. And then on deck we have a Ty Downing, Robert Danielson, Kelly Carlson, and Bruce Grief. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Letitia Wilson and I am the Executive Director at the Center Against Rape and Domestic Violence. We provide services to survivors of domestic and sexual violence in Linden Benton counties and I am support of Senate Bill 608 today. The survivors we work with are part of the 40% of Oregon households renting. Housing instability is one of the highest concerns for survivors and families we are working with. Affordable, secure housing is vital for survivors to create and maintain safety for themselves and their children. If rent increases continue, affordable housing will not be an option for a survivor who's thinking about leaving an abusive partner. Emergency confidential shelter, like my agency provides, may also not be an option because of the high need for shelter and our limited capacity. At this time, we're not able to provide shelter to everyone who is asking for it. The housing crisis has contributed to our inability to move people from shelter to affordable housing. An increase in rent would continue to impact our ability to transition families out of shelter and into their own homes. If affordable, if affordable housing and shelter are not an option, a family experiencing domestic violence is forced to stay in an unsafe, abusive home, be on the streets, or double up with another family. All of these options create dangerous situations that have negative impacts on the family's health and safety. No cause evictions are targeting the most vulnerable and create a burden for survivors. An eviction affects the survivor's ability to remain safe, creates family stress when they have to scramble to find housing or face homelessness. Do Thank you. Thank you. Again, members of the committee, my name is Britt Conroy and I'm Public Policy Director of Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, a statewide association of Christian denominations, congregations, and interfaith partners totaling over 160 organizations in all. I'm here to read a brief statement on behalf of Reverend Michael Grogan, a senior pastor at Congregational Church of Lincoln City. He's traveling for work today and he writes, I respectfully request your support of SB 608 to reduce no-cause evictions and provide greater housing stability to the approximately 40% of Oregonians who rent their homes. All persons deserve a safe, stable, and affordable place to call home. Yet today, current policy allows landlords to evict tenants without providing a, ca providing a cause, pr without providing cause, sometimes with as little as 30 days notice, and you increase rental costs by extreme and unreasonable amounts. <coughs> These evictions can act as vehicles for discrimination towards some of the most vulnerable in our society and increase the risk of homelessness. EMO serves nearly 19,000 individuals every year across the state through eight direct service programs, including a program that serves homeless youth who are striving to finish their high school, uh, finish high school. This EMO program is in partnership with the Lincoln County School District um, just last year 
serve the serve homeless youth, including uh, the one in six students in that school district who are experiencing homelessness. SB 608 is one of the one of the needed measures to address such displacement. Please vote to reduce no cause evictions. Sincerely, Reverend Michael Grogan, Congregational Church, Lincoln County, Lincoln City. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, Chair Fagan, members of the committee, my name is Kevin Cronin and I live in Eugene, Oregon. Um, I live in one of the largest apartment complexes in Eugene. I believe that housing stability directly leads to economic success. Housing gives people an opportunity to build a better life. Uh, in 2019, in order to succeed, you need a place to call home. According to the City of Eugene Rental Housing Policy Board, the Lane County housing market has a deficit of 13,500 affordable housing units. The high demand market has led to devastating consequences when a low income renter is no cause evicted. I serve on the Eugene Rental Housing Policy's Renter Protection Task Force. During a November renters roundtable, the presenter asked if anyone had been no cause evicted this was on campus, and every uh, if, if anyone had been no cause evicted or knew someone who had been, every single hand in the room uh, raised their hand. Uh, the same question was posed to a meeting of over 100 different grad students, um, and again, every single hand in the room raised their hand. Um, I've been no cause evicted three separate times. Each time was a no fault with the property being sold or the extensive remodeling to the entire apartment complex. Uh, each time was a major economic disruption. In 2011, following a no-cause eviction, I was homeless from June to September um, before I could get into a place. In 2015 and 2016, my limited savings were wiped out. Um, in the past two years, I've had three separate folks stay on my couch following their no-cause eviction, um, and I urge you to vote yes for this bill. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Fagan and, and members of the committee, my name is Elaine Friesen-Strang and I am the volunteer state president for AARP Oregon and we are pleased to endorse Senate Bill 608. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan social change organization with over a half a million members in the state of Oregon. An important aspect of our work is advocating for age-friendly communities, including access to affordable, safe, and accessible homes for Oregonians of all ages and abilities. It's estimated that the number of ad older adult renter households will more than double between now and 2035. In Oregon, over 40% of renters age 50 and older are cost burden. They're paying more than 30% of their income on housing. But more alarmingly is that almost 39% of renters age 65 and older and 55% of those 85 and older pay more than 50% of their income on housing. The average Social Security benefit in Oregon is $1,450 a month and it is the sole source of income for three out of 10 older Oregonians. This makes finding and keeping an affordable home a tremendous challenge. Mm -hmm. For older adults, loss of a home can mean loss of community ties and natural supports and displacement and even premature costly institutionalization requiring taxpayer dollars. We must protect the most vulnerable. AARP believes that this bill is a good step and we urge your support. Thank you very much. The next panel will come up and while they're coming up on deck is Bob Brown, Richard Greenstead, Soren Impey and Ann Ness. Chair Fagan, uh, members of the co committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Ty Downing. I'm an Oregon native, uh, born in Roseburg and raised in Philomath. My dad was a teacher, my mom was a homemaker. I love this state uh, and I love the work that I do, which is providing affordable housing. Uh, but I'm very concerned that Senate Bill 608 would actually have the uh, opposite of the intended effect. I believe we're going to see units sold uh, that are in the market in the rental market pool now be sold to owner occupied. It happens pretty routinely with with uh, any kind of rent control. And I'm also not I'm a little skeptical that the uh, that we won't experience the aforementioned uh, one way ratchet where we're starting this calculation that seems you know perhaps reasonable now. I'm not convinced we're going to. I think in a year or two we we'd, we'd see a change to that. That's a fear of mine. I've worked really hard for about 20 years, all that work has led to a pretty unlikely career. I rebuild fixer manufactured home parks. 
Um, my wife and I now have ownership in three parks. We typically, typically don't see profitability until two or three years of very intensive, very expensive work. I've emptied our, save, emptied our savings account numerous times uh, to, to put into properties. I've even gotten hard money loans because when uh, you know, plumbing and sewer systems fail, fail and, and wells fail, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. So including cleaning up property, repairing electrical, plumbing and sewer systems, resurfacing roads, installing street lights, demolishing and removing old homes, which cost a fortune due to, due to the asbestos, and bringing new homes in. But there's a market for my products, so I know that I can chart a course and be successful in time, so long as I have my communities functioning, I'm able to respond to market forces and I'm able to recover from unforeseen major repairs. And my fear, fear that this bill will el eliminate that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yes, uh, my name's Bruce Griff. I grew up in Molalo, Oregon. And uh, my father started in 1965 building the spaces that we got going. And my son and I also put 16 <laughs> more units in in uh, 95 and I have <laughs> excuse me we have uh, seniors it's a total senior court manufacturing community and we we have four people three people that are over 90 years old still living with us and it's it's really tough on them when they're out there uh, what, needing to do something, we we also always help them out, and uh, it's great. My son and I added 16 more spaces there, and I, my son and grandsons will be the third and fourth generation taking care of this these people. When we uh, when we started, or well, after I got out of service, <coughs> I started helping dad and mom build the court. And uh, it's, boy, I've run out of thought, guys. That's it. <laughs> Been here a long day, long time. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. So I'm Robert Danielson. I too have a similar story to them in that uh, I've been in the mobile home park industry for about 40 years. And uh, through the years, uh, going back into the 80s, when uh, nobody complained when it, we just about went broke because of the high interest rates and everything else with the developments that we had done at that time. And so, you know, you fast forward now, there was many, many years that we worked for free or for nothing for, for doing repairs, doing that, you know, midnight, whatever it was. And so with that, it's made it very challenging, uh, I mean, through the years. Now, it, the market is better. I'd be the first to admit that, and that's a good thing. Uh, but I think that something else I wanted to share about was we have uh, different regulations that come up, and we just, right now, we have a current um, home that we had to demolish that, uh, again, referring to, to his statement about the asbestos, that's been something that's new that is a regulation that's come in recently, and so it ended up, ended up costing about another six dollars $8,000 for the, the demolition of that home. And that's something that's not, not ever talked about or ever discussed, but those are additional costs that we end up having. We will have spent about uh, $20,000 on this demolition and, well, between the eviction, the, the demolition, attorney fees, and then uh, the asbestos removal to get the site clear and, and a vacant space. Now we'll have to, to fill up whatever it costs and, and time that takes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next panel and then on deck is going to be Christopher Lowe, Cheryl Dalton, Peter Schrainer, Sue and Sue Yang. Go ahead and begin. Chair and Senator Fagan and members of the committee, my name is Soren Impey and I'm a tenant and volunteer organizer with Portland Tenants United. Portlanders have been traumatized by a chronic housing crisis with a deficit of over 50,000 units affordable to lower income folk. The rent is also too damn high. Around 50% of Portland renters are cost burdened. Portland Tenants United supports Senate Bill 608 provisions that limit landlord price gouging and implement basic just cause eviction. 
However, we believe that this bill does not go far enough. I call on the Senate Housing Committee uh, to amend Senate Bill 608 as follows. The price gouging cap should be amended so that it genuinely stabilizes rent. I would suggest 1% plus CPI, a 4 to 6% annual increase uh, using today's uh, inflation rates. Oregon's communities are not all the same and should have the right to create local rent stabilization policies, eliminate the state preemption. The exemption for units built less than 15 years ago does not address the affordable housing shortage and should be removed. 30 days notice does not provide enough time to find housing. Tenants deserve a uniform 90 days for all evictions. Allowing landlords to evict after informal lease violation notices can create a loophole that could be exploited. We feel that this provision is unnecessary because landlords already have recourse in the courts. Uh, we also strongly feel that rent increases should not be allowed for units that violate habitability and safety standards and that uh, relocation fees should reflect the true cost of eviction. So it should be higher. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, Chair Fagan and members of the committee, uh, my name is Bob Brown and I'm a leader with the Metropolitan Alliance for Common Good, also known as MACG, which is a broad-based organization of 25 faith, labor, healthcare, and community nonprofits in the metropolitan Portland area. We organize around key process pressures on families in our institutions. Affordable housing emerged in 2015 as a top issue facing our members, and as the housing crisis continued to grow more severe and pervasive, more of our families and members of the community face constant threat of displacement and the possibility of homelessness. I'm here today on behalf of MACG's, uh, MACG to urge you to support Senate Bill two, uh, 6008 as a critical first step in bringing relief to tenants statewide. We recognize that this bill brings a measure of relief and assurance for all tenants in Oregon that exorbitant rent increases of 20%, 40% or greater throw families into crisis situations and we hope that that will stop. This is a good and essential beginning. We're concerned, however, for those who will be left out, for those families who will already experience a 10% increase as, cripple, as a crippling event, leaving them with few, if any, options. We hear regularly from adult, older adults and fixed in, uh, people on fixed incomes, people with disabilities and high percentage of Latino and refugee communities in our member institutions that one or more increases at the level that this bill allows will result in displacement. Much more is needed to further protect our families for, for evictions. MACG leaders are committed to working with ally organizations and the Oregon legislators to improve opportunities and protections for families, especially through the institution of local controls that enable communities to address housing challenges unique to their communities. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Chair Fagan, uh, members of the committee. My name is Richard Greenstead. I'm a rental provider in North Portland, and I support Senate Bill uh, 608. Uh, Chair Fagan, thank you for your leadership in tackling our uh, state's housing crisis. In short, uh, hardworking Oregonians uh, deserve stability. Ending no-cause evictions uh, gives renters the ability to remedy uh, lease violations, and it guards against discrimination. While I own a few buildings and the land that they sit on, uh, the tenant and their family considers that their home. And that comes with, with extra responsibility on my part and how I deal with that. To be clear, Oregon is experiencing a housing emergency. It's long past time to act. One of my units is rented in, to a family in need in partnership with Human Solutions. They're a great organization doing wonderful work in the community, but they're overburdened. Senate Bill 608 is a step in the right direction toward keeping those families in their homes so they don't experience the trauma of homelessness. Lastly, uh, stable housing plays a vital role in ensuring uh, students show up to school ready to learn. Uh, this bill will provide a positive contribution towards student success that I think we'll see in the future. Again, Chair Fagan, thank you for your leadership. Um, please support Senate Bill 608. Thank you. My name is Ann Messy, and I represent uh, Sustainable Economies Northwest, a group of scientists and climate scientists and uh, professionals that understand that we not only should, but 
must pass legislative law to maintain a sufficient supply of affordable rentals throughout the urban areas of Oregon. We, we must have a supply. Most we're, not everybody's gonna be able to own in the future. We know that already. It is well documented that the most significant way to reduce carbon emissions throughout the nation, the world, and in our state is in the area of urban housing and community design. We have to intelligently design housing so that everyone can have a home in some way. I think this bill is a start. It may not be perfect, but I actually trust you <laughs> that you can figure it out if you pass this committee. Uh, you have to have uh, urban housing is so necessary for urban transportation so people don't have to own a car. Um, urban um, renewable energy, you can have the energy grid serving, renewable energy grid serving those people. Um, so I think it's, it's a no, it's an obvious solution to the problem we're facing. Um, urban areas throughout Oregon are where the prominent number of jobs are, whether it be in Bend or any urban area. My definition of urban is broad. Uh, and uh, therefore we must concentrate our efforts on increasing affordable rentals and housing, increasing renewable energy power grids, all the other things that you're doing have to do with housing. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, and the next, well, the next panel is coming up. The, uh, the next on deck panel is Betty Holiday. Jessica Mathis, Terry Mills, and Kathy White. Those folks would come to the on deck chairs, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Peter Schrainer. Our family has developed and owned our 20 space, 55 and older manufactured home community in Milwaukee for over three decades now. We take great pride in keeping our park looking sharp and well maintained. In order to keep our park maintained, we need to increase the rent annually to keep up with the ever increasing costs to run the business. Payroll, health insurance, landscaping, water and sewer district charges, property taxes, insurance, etc., go up each year, not down. On some years with larger capital improvement projects, such as ripping out the concrete sidewalks and replacing them, we need to increase the rent by a higher percentage to help cover the capital costs. Manufactured home park owners provide their own streets within the community, which means we are not only financially responsible for their initial construction, but also their annual maintenance. The state does not need to create artificial rent control. What is needed is a reduction in development costs so we can provide more affordable housing. We have room on our land for four to five more units, but the development fees are so high it does not pencil out to develop the extra spaces. Putting an artificial rent control in place would severely limit our ability to keep our park looking sharp and well maintained. Rent control will also affect the long-term value of our business and property. If a potential buyer knows there is a cap on the maximum amount of rent they can charge, why on earth would they choose to invest their money in our park instead of a different investment without government restriction or control? The state does not regulate how much groceries cost at the market, but rather lets the market determine what is reasonable. A quick search on rent control shows nearly all economists agree it is a bad policy. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Sue Young, and uh, we have a small mobile home park, 74 spaces. Uh, we live in southeast, it's in southeast Portland, and with the sewer, the high water bills, et cetera, um, and we have an incredible uh, problem with crime. We've invested since uh, 2010 over $640,000 in putting high gates up, uh, keypads, camera system, meters on all the homes, and I can go farther, but I don't want to waste the time. Um, in 2004, our rent was $400 a year. We've chosen because we have such an issue with our area, and most of our tenants are extremely long-term, to not do rent increases. Our current rent is $450 for all the tenants that have been here in that amount of time. In 2015, we realized we weren't gonna stay solvent if we didn't increase, so our current rent from 15 to now is uh, $570 a month. 
with your proposal, while I understand its necessity and we've tried so hard to take care of the people in our community, um, we're going to be penalized and I don't know how we can make, make up the money that we have already spent. I don't know if we'll survive. Hi, I'm Cheryl Dalton, and I respectfully oppose the bill. Um, who really benefits from the passage of this rent cap bill? Uh, is it the residents? Not really, because if, the, if it did, they wouldn't be segregated from the newer buildings and the nicer neighborhoods. Is it the property owners? Not really, because they will have a harder time paying their bills and making it's Is it our neighbors? No, because with the decline in maintenance, so goes the value of it and the surrounding properties. So I'm wondering if we can look at other solutions, like maybe expanding the housing vouchers as a possible solution. Would that benefit our residents? Yes, because they would have the autonomy to choose where they will live a better neighborhood, closer to family, closer to work, more freedom to make their choices. Do the property, uh, property owners benefit from housing vouchers? Yes, because they could continue to operate in a free market and a free society. Will the neighbors benefit? Yes, because the property values will not decline but actually improve because the properties around them will continue to increase in value. So, and also, I do hope that we will continue looking at um, disallowing the no-cause evictions because one thing is clear is we don't want our residents to move. If you do put, sorry. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you for uh, holding these hearings. Uh, my name is Christopher Lowe. I live in half of a duplex in Portland. Um, I had some testimony about specifics, but uh, Soren MP, express them well. My written testimony has what uh, I had to say about that. Um, I want to address the process of this bill and also just note the fact that of the, the uh, supporters of the bill that I've been able to hear, virtually all of them have said it's a good start. So I, my main testimony is I hope the committee understands that that's the way that the tenant advocates are looking at this. You know, I, I, many of those people are people I work with all the time. I support my pastor, Mark Knudsen, you know, um, but I, I can't actually support the bill as it is, but I'm not actually opposing it either. But I, I want a more open discussion. My understanding has been that this bill is not going to be allowed to be amended. Uh, if I might have tried for political reasons to propose amendments if I'd understood that the other side was gonna be doing that. But, um, you know, that I feel like this is a railroad process. I feel like this is sort of a sham hearing. Um, uh, uh, and because there's no possibility, as I understand it, of, of it actually being changed. And I think that's wrong, it kind of, it, it, it uh, and and also the rental ad the tenant advocates and the tenants were excluded from discussions before the session and that's wrong but you know so the tenant rights movement not going away we're not done here and I'm not going to accept that this is the bill that fixes things thank you the next panel will come up and while they're coming up on deck is Adam Cook Corey Hoare Andrew Schilling and Tom Jarmer. All right, here we go. go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Fagan and members of the committee. My name is Betty Holliday and I'm a lifelong renter. I'm also a resident of Multnomah County and I'm here to tell you that with the rent restrictions or the rent control that has been enacted, we have been able to stop the bleeding there. So I just wanted to make note of that. 
Um, having weathered two no-cause evictions within the past four years, I fully appreciate the efforts of this groundbreaking bill. This bill does have some holes in it. I think people recognize that. The one that I want to speak to very briefly is just about the exemption from paying reload for those landlords with less than five rental units. My two no-cause evictions were from mom-and-pop landlords. It cost me a pretty penny to move. These can be very <coughs> unstable living arrangements so I would encourage people to look at that again I will say that like other landlords they literally hold the lives of their tenants in their hands I really do appreciate the efforts for this bill and even if it passes as it is I think it will put exempted landlords on notice in any case for me passage of this bill can't come soon enough Hi, my name is Jessica Mathis. I'm the housing coordinator at Bradley Engel, an agency in North Portland that serves uh, survivors of domestic and sexual violence, as well as culturally specific programs for African American and LGBTQ survivors. I want to speak to the impact that I believe this bill will have specifically on survivors. Um, I've, been, I've worked in housing for over five years, and while we can't always guarantee safety for survivors, I've noticed some fairly disturbing trends. Oregon has fairly good protections for survivors in housing when they're experiencing domestic violence. And I have seen repeatedly no-cause evictions being used to circumvent those protections. Um, I've seen folks in the midst of a crisis, kids who've called the police, and then later um, the landlord issuing a no-cause notice. Um, I've also seen as a provider of rent assistance, folks being issued no-cause evictions or not being allowed to renew their lease after rent assistance has ended. And when you have a family that's finally stabilized after a crisis, gone to counseling, um, been in shelter, kids are in school, feeling safe, and then to be issued a, a no-cause um, termination or to not be allowed to continue their lease and then have to move, that family is no longer eligible for rent assistance, that um, family uh, probably didn't have the opportunity to save for a new deposit, um, is completely destabilizing. and. Um, is setting that family back from the DV and is perpetuating uh, uh, <laughs> is perpetuating poverty for that family as well as the impact of trauma. So thank you. Thank you both. Well, the next panel is coming up. Uh, we'll get the next on deck panel. So I, I called Terry Mills and Kathy White, but I don't think either of them came. So we'll uh, skip them and go to Maria Hernandez, Trish Weatherby, Paulina Harmony Bartnick, and Adia Meza. Go ahead, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, Chair Fagan and many members of the of the uh, committee. Uh, my name is Adam Cook. I'm president of Commonwealth Real Estate Services and also a part owner of this management company. We manage approximately 75 manufactured home communities or mobile home parks, as most people call them, uh, in Oregon. And uh, my family also is uh, past developers of a couple manufactured home communities in Milwaukee. Be between the four communities that are family owned, we have about 266 uh, home sites that we provide. And I wanted to let you know that our, uh, our company manages properties for owners of these communities who are the largest source of non-subsidized affordable housing in the state of Oregon. And we're very proud of that fact. And we're concerned with uh, House, uh, excuse me, uh, Senate Bill 608. Um, uh, to my knowledge, there's an exception in, or excuse me, there's an exception in this bill for uh, new developments that have occurred within the last 15 years, which actually provides protection to a total of zero manufactured home communities in the state of Oregon as it stands today, because there hasn't been a new manufactured home community built, to my knowledge, in the last 20 years. So we need to do something to resolve that issue. There's no incentive for developers to come into this market now and to, and to build new manufactured housing stock. Um, also, there was mention earlier about predictability. We need predictability for manufactured or for um, for rents, 
And in uh, about 25 years ago, the uh, state of Oregon required that uh, we come up with a statement of policy which provides information on the communities that we manage and a rent history so that there is predictability. It shows you the last five years of what the rent charges have been in the community. In closing, I will just say that I feel like uh, being a housing provider in the state of Oregon with this bill moving forward actually is uh, a bit of a penalty to us for having done so. And we uh, wish you to uh, oppose it, please. Thank you. My name is Tom Jarmer. I am the owner of Ridge Real Estate Management Group, longtime member, board member, and past president of Manufactured Housing Communities of Oregon. I have been in the management and ownership of residential housing for 25 years and consider myself a responsible landlord. I own and operate manufactured home communities, and yes, I raise rents when needed, but I've also kept my rent stable in times of tough economies. I've also subsidized rents for some of my residents on fixed incomes who cannot afford any increases. I anticipate this bill passes in the form it is, I will no longer be able to subsidize any of my residents and will increase my rents annually in order to save for capital improvement costs. Though this bill carves out the properties for 15 years old or newer, as Adam stated, there isn't any in the manufactured housing industry. Um, most of the communities are well beyond that age and many are at the point of needing capital improvements to road, street lighting, water and sewer, and other infrastructure. With no ability for landlords to recoup these capital expenses, many communities will deteriorate. I myself have a community in Shady Cove, Oregon, that several years ago cost me over $65,000 to find water and drill a new well for the community when my original well failed. I did not have an option. There is no city water system in the city of Shady Cove. I believe that some sort of mechanism for capital improvement should also be addressed in Senate Bill 608. I don't believe this in any way would delay this work session of the passage of the bill. The manufactured housing industry is the largest source of affordable housing in Oregon, and I believe that adding an amendment to address these capital expenditures will go a long way with preserving that history of affordable housing. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. My name is Corey Poole. I am one of the family owners of Paradise Island Park here in Salem, manufactured home park. I am a third generation park owner and operator. Across our state, there are many parks that are facing a ticking time bomb. These parks are populated primarily with pre-HUD 1950s and 60s era homes. Many of them have their original water and sewer systems, and many have not kept up with maintenance. Most park owners don't make any profit bringing in new homes, and we certainly don't make any profit by repairing and upgrading infrastructure. We do these things to improve our parks so that they can remain viable businesses into the future. Who will come forward to improve these parks? Who will invest the hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring in new homes, upgrade water and sewer systems, and repave streets? Banks will not give loans for these activities. Current and future residents won't spend $150,000 to bring a new home into a park that is literally falling apart. So I ask again, who will invest in these older parks when there's no hope of a reasonable return on investment? I appreciate our state is in a housing crisis. I understand that people of every kind of housing find themselves increasingly pinched, but our industry is not the problem. We we have the data to show that manufactured home parks remain an affordable housing option for people. Manufactured home parks do not be need to be included in this bill. Please leave us out of it and let us continue to provide affordable housing options that our customers enjoy. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Fagan and members of the committee. Uh, I am Andrew Schilling and I'm here representing Caven and Company. We are a rental property owner and we have been creating new market rate and affordable housing in North Portland since 2004. We are strongly committed to providing safe and stable housing for Portland families. We do support the no cause evictions portions of this bill. We also support a stabilized marketplace for renters. However, Senate Bill 608 falls short on promoting the, the dramatic and sustained increase in housing production that is necessary to ultimately address our current and ongoing crisis. We do expect Senate Bill 608 to make it riskier for us to make new properties available to our community. We also expect Senate Bill 608 to increase the barrier for entrepreneurs seeking to enter the development market. It's true that we can't just build our way out of this mess, but ultimately, we're going to have to build our way out of this mess. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the next panel is coming up. Uh, on deck is Lori Swan, William Birdwell, <coughs> Jeff Denson, and Robert Swan, Swan from Oregon Property Owners.
Good evening, Chair Fagan and members of Senate Committee on Housing. My name is Maria Hernandez Segoviano, and on behalf of Opal Environmental Justice Oregon, we thank you for allowing us to provide comments on Senate Bill 608. Today marks civil rights leader Rosa Parks' birthday. In celebration of her work, we at Opal celebrate by participating in Transit Equity Day, a national holiday uplifting public transportation as an equity, equitable climate change solution. As Rosa Parks once said, you must never be fearful about what you are doing when it is right. We believe that providing a foundation to families and communities with housing that is stable, safe, and affordable is the right thing, and we must act now. OPAL is a membership-driven organization working to build power and leadership of those most impacted by environmental justice issue, in issues like housing. OPAL supports this legislation because Senate Bill 608 provides some relief to the 40% of Oregonians who rent their home by stabilizing their rents and any no-cost evictions. The bill addresses a statewide crisis with a statewide solution. Just Cause Eviction Standards are a low-cost policy tool for preventing displacement. The tool meets a number of important goals and has broader implications, not least among them being, protecti being protecting tenants from unjust evictions. These protections preserve social and economic diversity, provide tenants with stable and affordable rents, and keep communities together. Secure housing is a human right, but in Oregon, this right is denied to too many. Senate Bill 608 begins to provide a relief for Oregonian renters by requiring landlords to meet basic standards that prevent exploitation of the basic human right, human need for shelter. In short, passes of Senate Bill 608 is the right thing to do. Please help our communities be secure in their rights and strengthen the bans of this regulation. Hello, um, my name is um, Paulina Harmony Bartnick, and um, I've been in Portland, um, the vicinity of Portland for seven years and um, in Gresham for two, um, about five years, I, I moved to two different apartments. One was a no-cause eviction and the other apartment, they raised the rent from 850 to 1200. I couldn't live there anymore, even with help from the government. Um, uh, they put things on my record, said I owed this money. I didn't even know where that, they, they tarnish your record. They, they have any legal right to do whatever they want to your record, landlords and property managements. Both of the apartments I had were property managements, big property managements. They owned hundreds of buildings all over the state of Oregon and they're in California and they, they have so many apartments they don't even know you know, they don't even address the tenants properly. They, they just, they, they're ruthless in their practices. It's just unbelievable. Finally, I moved into Portland and um, I feel some protection. I feel a lot safer. I'm in Relay Resources. It's a, a, a building for, that helps minorities and disability. And um, it's a relief. It actually is a, Tremendous relief to be in that apartment. I can't tell you I felt traumatized those, um, with those rent uh, landlords. They're 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 uh, greedy, very greedy, thank and you. they don't want any regulations. Thank you very much. Like thank you very much for your testimony. Meltdown, no regulations. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for letting me speak before the committee. Uh, my name is Trish Weatherby. Uh, I have been um, the landlord, landlady of six um, stick homes, as they call it in the industry, um, and um, a social worker, um, a loan officer, uh, and a real estate agent. Uh, I am now um, a senior and a disabled person, a transient dependent renter with little discretionary income. Having a safe home is becoming harder and harder. Every year I get a rent increase even though legal aid has informed me that there may be things in my lease which would not allow that um, as a multi-year uh, lease uh, possessor. Um, as I say, I'm on a fixed income um, already that is untenable. Um, 
I, um, my last rent increase was $50 a month, which may not seem like much to you, but um, it was hard to take uh, under my wing. Uh, uh, this rent increase and others have brought me immense worry and stress in thinking about whether I will be able to afford to live here. Um, I want to tell you that I pay the highest space rent for dirt on which to put my manufactured home in Oregon. It's $900. Oh, thank you. Hi, um, my name's John Dearborn. I'm, thank you that I'm able to address the committee. I'm on the board of SEIU Local 49. I'm on the executive board. I represent 650 security officers. I myself actually own a house well, me and the bank do. And uh, my uh, mortgage payment is less than many rent payments, which is absolutely ridiculous. I can tell you many stories, but I'm gonna tell you of just one. This lady's 38 years old. She's been providing for herself and being independent for over 20 years. Her rent went from 650 to 950 for just because, no improvements, nothing. The air conditioner still doesn't work and there's still mildew on her windows. She had to move back in with her parents so that she had a place to live. And you know how hard that is to move back in with your parents after you've been independent for so long. You guys have a chance to use common sense. Something that I took out when I went and started knocking on doors last year in East County to get a certain person elected so that we could shake up this mess. I'm a Republican knocking on doors for a Democrat. That's how scary this is for our members. If you guys do not do anything to bring a, a ceiling to rent increases, if you do not stop no cause eviction, we will end up just like San Diego and San Francisco and California will be just down the road because we won't be able to pay taxes. And guess what happens? You can't pay taxes. State can't pay their bills and they go bankrupt. So use your common sense and do the right thing. Thank you, John. Thank you. As the next panel is coming up, uh, I will have Jay Brown, Tina Cummings, David Smith, and Carol, Carol Slavosky. <coughs> so this panel is Lori Swan, William Birdwell, Jeff Denson, and Robert Swan. Okay, so you're the, you're on deck. Okay. Maybe you're not a big baseball fan, so on, you're up next. So then, to, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Jeff Denson out of Beaverton. Uh, thank you, Senator Fagan and the committee. Thank you for the hearing. Um, I've been a property manager for multifamily units since 1997. I've managed uh, throughout the Willamette Valley by helping to buy properties with deferred maintenance, which in many cases are basically slums. Uh, slums have become the affordable housing solution for years. Um, and sadly, there are many silent slums in Oregon where citizens are living in deplorable conditions. SB 608 will halt the type of purchases and renovations that I've been involved with, which go in and fix up substandard housing. Um, residents of buildings with deferred maintenance will suffer. Um, specifically, I'm against relocation fees since people who break the rules and endanger other residents will eventually be essentially paid to leave. Uh, the emergency clause is reckless since the law has many new and complicated changes. And also, what happens when rents drop? The bill does not address normal changes in the market. I've been through two significant market changes where rents dropped significantly. I've managed properties where we've had to give 60 days of rents free to find residents. And right now, the market has already stabilized in Beaverton and Portland and Salem, markets where we are. Um, managing a multifamily property is very difficult. We are responsible for everything that happens on the property. We have a lot of liability. Spe specifically with severe unforeseen costs. Last thing, really quick, development costs are $250 a square foot. That means right now it costs $250,000 to build a two-bedroom apartment. It's outrageous. Thank you. Much. 
Yeah, Mike Swan speaking for Lori Swan. I think if we look at the history, and if you look at the history to see what's going to happen before you make a decision, that would be a marvelous, a marvelous move. Appreciate you taking the time to analyze what's going on. In the Selwood area, for instance, there is a huge amount of building and growth going on there, and the rents are already being adjusted, and they will be adjusted more as we go on. And you're seeing that across Portland as well. That The sad part is there's a cap on your property taxes, but that does not take into consideration the sewer and the water. And so what happens is you, you're forced to raise your rents because everything is, is going up. And if we want to really control the whole scenario, you have to control the water and the sewer as well. This is, this is mandatory to make this happen. And the, absolutely the best deal for rent is low-income manufactured housing. By far, it's the very best affordable housing. And as it was stated by a few folks here talking prior, that's not being encouraged. And what did you say, 250000 to build? I mean, that's, that's astronomical. And if the government does it, it's 350000 So we need to encourage private industry to get more involved, and we need to actually have affordable housing, which would be RV parks or manufactured parks, something where you could do it for $150,000 instead of three hundred fifty dollars or 250000 my name is Bob Swan. Our family has uh, worked hard. We've developed a couple of manufactured parks. We own several uh, individual rentals and some multifamily. Um, the manufactured parks, we are all like community, friends. Um, we've always been very fair with our tenants, and we've got a strong community. Things like what's going on here just kind of drives a wedge between us and, and our renters and our friends. Um, I'm thinking a couple things that we might think about doing is, number one, the no-cause eviction. Maybe we ought to step back and take a look at what the rules are. I think sometimes maybe we have too many attorneys and cause problems to make it hard to get somebody out that's really disruptive and not fair to other folks. Um, limiting that could really hurt us. Um, part of the SB 608 that restricts the sales of our properties, we have worked for years to develop what we have now. And taking that away from us, limiting what we can do on sales, is taking my retirement away. I'm self-employed. I don't have a retirement, a government paycheck coming in to take care of that. Um, I really, that one bothers me a lot. So I'd like to see maybe that part out of the bill. And again, as somebody said before, I would love to see manufactured housing removed from this. We are true affordable housing without government help. And thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is William Birdwell. I've, I've submitted <clears throat> written testimony on your website. And uh, uh, I would ask that you go read it. I'm not going to read it, but I, 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 uh, I've already written and sent to you. I just have a couple of comments, and actually my thinking has evolved a lot. I've not been involved in the legislative process before, and I've been listening to this today. And, and uh, I think that my basic conclusion is this is a bad bill. It doesn't address the problems which genuinely exist in Oregon. We need more low-income housing, and that's what you need to promote, and nothing in this bill really does that. Um, the no cause eviction I will comment on. I, I, uh, I sure wish I had had that in, uh, in Los Angeles. I sold a Los Angeles duplex and moved here because there was a 3% limit on <laughs> increases of, in, I wasn't making any money off it on increases in rent. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, you re, landlords really need low co uh, no, no uh, cause eviction for reasons that have already been stated by other people more eloquently than I can now. And there's a simple solution if you're worried about people evicting someone for no cause so they can rent it to someone else for a higher rent. Just prohibit that. What is the thing you're trying to stop? Prohibit it. And it won't happen. I have a lot of other things to say, but I just would um, ask you to look at the statement that I submitted in a way. Thank you. Thank you very much. As the next panel is coming up, I want to call Deborah Romarin, 
Anita Gluck, Manisha, Lauren Landon, and Mike Whitey on deck. Members of the committee, my name is Carol Sokowski, and I currently live with my husband in my Nana-in-law's house in Shaw. I'm one of the very lucky people that have had family that has room in their home for us to stay. I'm here today as someone who's had to make tough decisions about housing while experiencing multiple health issues. I know I don't look it, but I've had to be on dialysis for six years. At the time, I did at-home dialysis. The apartment we were in did not have room for it. I had to travel from Kaiser to South Salem to my parents' home to do it. We could not afford a bigger place. Now, if we could have afforded a bigger place, then I could have done the at-home dialysis in my own home. I could have spent more time with my husband. I could have done my treatments in privacy. I wouldn't have had to worry about the train every morning trying to get to my parents' house. And not only have I done dialysis for six years, I've also had to have two kidney transplants. And the recovery process is intense. Having privacy during it would have been extremely helpful. The anti-rejection medications are extreme. And some of the side effects are quite embarrassing. Having a stable home, not worrying about changes in rent or eviction, takes so much stress away. We need to support our communities because we don't know what they're going through. Your decision here will help many Oregonians facing these kind of difficult decisions every day. And thank you for hearing my testimony and please support Senate Bill 608. Hi, my name is Tina Cummins. Since August of last year, we have been homeless. Homeless is not just on the streets, but it's everywhere. You're looking downtown at teenagers. It's not people on in tents, but I and six of my family live in the Courtesy Motel in two rooms. I'm 63, my husband is 78 with severe health problems. We cannot afford, we were evicted. Our rent went from 1495 to 1800. We had 10 days to move. We've lost everything. We've lost our storage units. We've lost our house. We've lost our car. And the only thing that we haven't lost is being family. I work at the airport. My husband is retired. He's had several strokes. His blood pressure is high, he's got high cholesterol, he's legally blind, and he can't hardly walk. We live in a two-bedroom motel room with seven people. Let's talk about homeless. Homeless is always everywhere. It's in the motels. It's downtown where all the kids live. It's tents underneath the bridges. You have people living everywhere that can be homeless. Don't just claim that homeless is in tents underneath bridges. We need to have a place that's safe. We need to have places that are reliable and less expensive. Very I much. support this bill and it needs to go somewhere. Thank you very much. Tara Pagan and members of the committee, my name is Shannon Billhauer. I'm the executive director of Habitat for Humanity of Oregon. Um, I first started with Habitat for Humanity here in Salem back in 1999 and went on my first home visits. And I want to tell you that since 1999, I can tell you firsthand that Oregon renters have been living with mold on the walls. They've had all kinds of egregious repair needs that they have not reported to their landlord or anyone for fear of a no-cause eviction. Um, we see this every day at Habitat for Humanity all across our state, um, in eastern Oregon, along the coast, in the Portland metro area, in very rural towns. People are living with things that they just shouldn't have to contend with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I will forever remember the household who was saving, saving each month for a down payment 
in a home where the mom had to wash the walls every day with bleach because our kids have asthma and the mold was so egregious. Instead of using the dressers against the wall because the clothes would get moldy, they put them in trash bags on the couch and on the patio under the awning, they stayed drier than inside the home. Um, the situation is that people are just working hard trying to have healthy kids who can go to school and um, if only, right, if only every landlord were as responsible as the ones we've been hearing from today. So thank you for your serious consideration of Senate Bill 608. Thank you very much. While the next panel is coming up, uh, on deck is Raina Gillette, Emmy Ritter, Jeff Zittle, and Charlie Pearson. Thank you, Senator Fagan, and Vice Chair Gerard, whom I've known for 30 years or more, but not recently. My name is Mike Whitty, and I speak to you today as a tenant in a mobile home park, former manager of that park, and I became an approved trainer, one of three in the state for an organization that I formed, Oregon Park Managers Association, providing the required continuing education class for managers and owners of mobile home parks. I would that apartment owners had a required continuing education class and would learn the kinds of things that I know about the landlord-tenant industry. When I first came into this industry as a park manager, the park owner told me, Mike, my interests and the tenant's interests are joined at the hip. And he ran the park that way. Most mobile home parks are like the neighborhood that I grew up in in the 1940s and the 1950s. The neighbors know one another and watch out for one another. They are a different category from the category that SB 608 addresses and should be treated accordingly by exempting them from this bill. Thank you, Senator Fagan and members of the committee. My name is Anita Gluck Manishin. Before going to law school, I was the Housing Program Coordinator for Multnomah County Community Action Agency. For the past 32 years, I have been a bankruptcy attorney, primarily representing debtors. Thus, I have always been involved in issues regarding affordability, whether it's of health care, housing, mortgages, and food. I am the owner of two du duplexes, both my former residences. My feeling about this bill is that there are some good parts and some bad parts. I applaud the rent control provisions for all the reasons stated, and the allowable amount is within the reasonable expectations of the parties. It is hard for me to imagine renting an apartment to someone for $1,500 a month, and then within the first year, jacking up the rent to another $150. That's not what we, or they expected us to bargain for. However, removing no cause eviction and substituting a three strikes, you're out cause eviction only encourages breaches by tenants. That is the portion of the bill that I would like the committee and the legislature to look at. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Deborah Romero, and I own a 14-pad little mobile home park and also in Gresham and a small fourplex. Mm -hmm. Took me years and years of diligently saving money for a down payment for that my first property. And I've been through good times, and I've been through really tough times that were so bad I thought I might lose the manufactured park. 
I couldn't raise rents for years, even though my costs kept going up. I lost a lot of sleep during those years, but held on hoping I might make up for the losses when times improve for the industry and for my residents. I now have a stable, well-run park where my residents know they enjoy some of the most affordable living in the greater Portland area. Many of my tenants have become friends. If rent control had been in effect, I would have never chosen to invest in residential housing. I would never have willingly shouldered this much risk only to have caps on my rent and the government monitoring my business in this way. I never thought I would be considered part of the problem. I'm part of your solution. But yet, the newer construction owners are exempt. They've driven up rents. They charge fee upon fee in addition to rents. This type of legislation hurts people like me, who should be encouraged to offer housing. And you really don't want to push people like me out, but you will be actually rewarding and all of it will be left to big corporations. And I really don't want to uh, have to raise rents at a frequency in an amount that I wouldn't even consider without rent control. Thank you for, uh, for your consideration. Thank you both very, all very much. Well, the next panel is coming up. I believe we have our last um, panel for folks who oppose the bill. So Michael Swan, actually, I believe I already called him. <coughs> Michael Swan, yeah, I, I thought I already called him. Yeah, yeah. So Dale Strom, John Fleck, Hannah Shooting Bear, and Ray Nutting, you are on deck. Hello and thank you, Chair Fagan, Vice Chair Gerard, members of the committee. My name is Raina Gillette and I live in Northeast Portland. I'm helping residents organizing for change. I've been a renter in Portland for 13 years. I moved to Oregon to have the opportunity to go to college and explore this beautiful landscape. I've moved nearly every year since coming to Oregon. Most of my work experience has been in the service industry and I'm proud of that work. It got me through college but I didn't make much money. My monthly income barely paid for half of my monthly rent. I wasn't able to stay for emergencies, basic needs, and doctor visits. In 2015, when faced with the reality of having to quickly move out of my costly apartment, I did not have the means to pay the deposit on another place to live. Luckily, my coworker let me buy her van with a monthly payment agreement. And for two years, I lived in that van and I named her Betty. All this stress happened in my life while finishing my senior year at Portland State and working at a grocery store. Living in my vehicle co created constant stress in my life and added to my inability to have much hope. Because I'm not that far removed from other Oregonians who are living on the streets, facing rising costs of rent and scraping to get by, that is why I do this work and why I'm asking you to vote yes on SB 608. Having safe, stable places to call home can mean having the foundation to go out and do things for your community, explore, and have opportunity. That is what home has done for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Fagan <clears throat> uh, and Senators. Thank you. Uh, my name is Charlie Pearson. I'm a public defender in Portland, and I'm here. We heard a little bit from uh, advocates for crime victims. Um, I've lived in a trailer park when I was a kid in a tent. I've lived in a home that my family built. I've lived in my car and I've rented as an adult. And um, and I think that everything that everyone has had to say has been important and valuable. I want to ask you all to consider, please, uh, a partial list of things that you have probably done in your home in the last week or so uh, that I have had clients get arrested for. Have you? Use the bathroom? Have you taken a shower? Have you plugged in your phone? Have you shaved? Have you made coffee? Have you changed your clothes? Have you slept? Have you shouted at the TV? Have you told someone that they had to leave? Have you had a beer? Have you gotten in an argument? Have you disciplined a child? These are all things that are your right to do in your home. And these are all things that I have had clients arrested for doing, merely because they lacked a safe home to do them in. I know that this is not the answer, but we need to put the brakes 
on cost increases. We need stability. So next up is Dale Strom, John Fleck, Hannah Shooting Bear, and Ray Nutting. And then I believe our final panel that is on deck is Nancy Shute, Ruth Ann Barrett, Amira Sahir, and Felisa Higgins. After, after all the, the names that we have on the list, I'll definitely make sure that if anybody is still out there. So I appreciate you speaking up. Go ahead, Ms. Rainbear. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, Chairwoman Fagan, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate Housing Committee. My name is Hannah Schutteman. I live in Salem, a mother and a grandmother, struggling to help my family stay healthy and have stable housing. I care give for two of my adult children who have long-term disabilities and their mental disabilities. My family and I have lived in the same apartment here in Salem since 2001, which I moved here in 2002, 2000, 2000. But the apartment I'm staying, but though we have worked hard to keep up the rental increases, we live in constant fear of a no cause, because right now I'm experiencing that now. I lost the income, my daughter's income, so now I can't pay the rent. We keep it clean with regular shampooing, but it's gone to the battle, to the point where the, there's nails coming through the floor and I'm diabetic and I have health issues myself. There's black mold on the walls and my, my granddaughter and myself has asthma. We got exposed, but in the meantime, I remained fearful of retaliation by the property managers, because they are big. We all want decent, secure home for, for my family, a home we pay more and more for when the ability to evict us causes, gives us landlord the weapon of scaring their tenants into accepting living conditions no human being <laughs> have to accept. Please hear our voices, and please vote to protect tenants from those who exploit us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nancy Shute, Ruth Ann Barrett, Amira Sahir, and Felisa Higgins. You can go, you couldn't come up too then. There's plenty of seats, yeah. Is there anyone else who is waiting to be heard on Senate Bill 608? If you would raise your hand so I can know if we have any folks left. Okay, are you for or against? Again. Okay, I'll, I'll call you up next. And there was, sorry, there's one more in the back there. Are you for or against? Four. Okay, come on up. Oh, okay. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Yasin Frank Southall. I'm a community organizer with an organization named Jane Place Neighbor Sustainability Initiative in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, one of the reasons why I travel over 2,000 miles to speak to you about the passage of SB 608 is because we are looking at this as not just having impact in Oregon, but having an impact nationwide. This is one of the most progressive housing legislation pieces um, ever produced. Um, I believe that no-cause evictions are immoral, unethical, and are regressive. Housing stability is the foundation for creating healthy communities, economic opportunities, educational success. No-cause evictions, dramatic extreme rent increases, are dangerous to human survival and thriving. Furthermore, no-cause evictions and drastic rent increases have led many folks uh, from Oregon, um, native, New native folks from Oregon, to come to New Orleans first adding to the strain um, to Southern Louisiana's housing crisis. And so we see a lot of parallels with what's going on in Oregon, um, and we're seeing people leaving Oregon um, in drastic waves coming to our city and creating a bigger issue in New Orleans, um, as you all probably know. Passing this bill will create a wave of progressive housing laws across the country. Oregon has changed our country via progressive laws many times, um, time and time again. Please do again. I pray and please ask you to pass this bill, not just for Oregon, but for the country. And I really mean it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Yavira Corona Torres, and I'm in support of the SB 608. I have suffered housing issues since I was a child, 
and now as an adult. I had to change my daughter's school a lot due to having to change to due to having to change homes a lot. Um we wanted to rent in Silverton where when we got kicked out, he had to sleep in our car with my five month baby who had just had a surgery. A heart surgery. They kicked us out because I couldn't work in the agriculture work. <laughs> we had to give my seven year old to my mom because we didn't want her to sleep with us in the car. It was November, very cold. We all know how wet the weather is. <sighs> Sorry. We all know how the weather is, and we needed to put my daughter with my mom. She had to change a lot of schools because at first, before moving to Silverton, we were going roommate to roommate, house to house, and my daughter got to the point where she told me to just leave her somewhere. She didn't want to keep on living with me due to the, us having to move so much. So when we moved to Silverton, I was pregnant, high risk due to my diabetes, couldn't work, had to sign a contract saying that I was gonna work in agriculture work for you know the rest of the time. My daughter's born. She was, she was born with brain, extra fluid on her brain. She was born with four holes in her heart and an enlarged heart. Obviously, that couldn't pre yeah, prevent me from working. Couldn't work. And in September, she had surgery. By November, they kicked us out due to me not being able to work in agriculture. We were put to sleeping in the car from November till December, a whole month with my five-month daughter staying with us in the car. Please, I beg you, and I know there's other people out there living a situation like I had to go through. Just please, please, be in favor of this law. I beg you. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, Chair Fagan, uh, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Felisa Hagans. I'm the political director for SCAU Local 49. I don't think I have anything more impactful than the tenants that you've heard from tonight to say. Um, SCAU represents about 75,000 workers throughout the state of Oregon, and many of our members have been in front of you today talking about their housing issues and the crises they face. I think oftentimes we think of low-income people as being impacted by this, but this is clearly a working families issue for us. Um, our members make a wide range of incomes from $15 an hour all the way up to $120,000 an hour. We have a respiratory therapist who lives in Lincoln City who has been living in a trailer, um, that, on a van type camper for the last six months. He makes $85,000 a year because he cannot find affordable housing on the coast. Um, so the issue is a wide ranging set of factors and we encourage you to support Senate Bill 608 um, and send it to the floor as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> While this last person comes up, is there anyone else who wants to be heard on Senate Bill 608? <coughs> and while she's coming up, Mr. Southall, I'm so sorry. I saw We saw your name on here, but it looked like we thought somebody had scribbled out the over 100 miles, but you came like many, many thousand miles, so I apologize that we took you at the very last. We thought somebody had scribbled out that they came, so I really apologize. Yeah, I just wanted to let folks from here speak before I did, even though I came from Thank you. Ways. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Kelly Salnardi. I am a property manager um, for a premier manufactured housing uh, community in Southern Oregon, Jackson County. Um, this has been an experience today. Never done this. Uh, my company asked me to uh, speak on their behalf. Um, however, I, as I'm reading through my talking points, a lot of them is been covered but one of the things that I think lacks is that in my industry manufactured housing it's very affordable it's the first time that people can become homeowners I myself rent in a manufactured home community 
Um, not the one I work at though. And um, I wouldn't have been able to be a homeowner had it not been for the manufactured housing community and the affordable rents that it provided for me and my family. I was able um, to provide my family stability. My son started kindergarten in the same school district that he will graduate next year in, um, as well as adopting children into our home because of that stability that we are able to um, provide. Um, if Senate Bill 608 passes, I just see that it's gonna put more strain on the government system. Um, it, I work with girls, teen moms, who are homeless, and um, they live in government housing. The rent is more than manufactured housing. And I work for a company that does not increase the rate, the rents at enormous prices. I live in a manufactured home community that does, but I don't work for one that does. And there are good landlords out there and there are good property owners out there. Um, so anyways, that's my testimony. Thank, Thank you. you very much for being patient. All right, I believe that concludes our public hearing. Is there anyone else that has been waiting to be heard on Senate bill? 608. Okay. With that, I will close the public hearing on Senate Bill 608. And open a work session on Senate Bill 608. Chair Fagan, I move uh, that the rules be suspended for the purpose of taking action on the Dash 1 amendments without having a fiscal or revenue impact statements on hand at this time. Thank you. Senator Canope moves that the rules be suspended for the purpose of taking action on the Dash 1 amendments without having fiscal or revenue impact statements on hand at this time. Is there any discussion? Is there any objection? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, to suspend the rules? This is just to suspend the rules, and then we will then vote on the, the Dash 1 amendment. Mm -hmm. sure. Seeing none, so moved. Thank you, Chair Fagan. I move to adopt the Dash 1 amendment stated 131 2019. Thank you, Senator Canope. Moves to adopt the Dash 1 amendment stated 131 2019. Would you like to summarize the Dash 1 amendment just for the purpose of the discussion? Madam Chair, members of the committee's Dash 1 amendment removes the emergency clause in favor of an effective date of 91st day after signing day adjournment. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair Fagan. Uh, I recognize that um, this bill is not likely to change, but um, the emergency clause is going to create substantial problems within the, uh, the rental market for owners and people who have current projects underway. And it would be good to give them some time to be able to react to uh, what, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, this is a substantial legislation legislation and nothing like it in the country. And I think it's important that uh, rental owners understand what it is that's been passed so they can uh, react in a way to adhere to the law. Further discussion, Senator Gerard? Thank you, Chair <clears throat> I would agree with my colleague from Ben. This is a huge piece of legislation and we owe it to the landlords to get the message out and to fast track for this so uh, some people are, are inadvertently going to uh, break a rule here or there when they think they're abiding by the law and then face severe penalties uh, I find very unfair and so just to tidy up the bill a little bit it would be nice to remove the emergency clause Further discussion, Senator Mona Sanderson. Uh, thank you, Chair, ben, uh, Chair Fagan. Uh, this bill has been so well vetted, um, and it started uh, with uh, some significant legislation with House Bill 2004 in 2017. Um, I feel strongly that um, it should go forward without any amendments. I'm a landlord. I've had a duplex for 34 years. And um, 
And yes, I've used no clause evictions. I'm one of those landlords that doesn't raise their rents, um, but that's just my, my choice. But every one of the no cause evictions that I had um, would were for cause. I could have gone through the for cause. And I think it's important that once I talked with the tenants, most of them didn't want to have an eviction on their record. And so most of them we could um, take care of um, by talking through what would help them and what would also be help me. So I am opposed to the Dash 1 amendments and any other amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Moss Anderson. Any further discussion on the, the Dash 1 amendment? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I will not be supporting amendments to this bill. While I do understand the concern, I think my, our colleagues make make a reasonable point. But I, um, I am, have been struck that um, my, my general perspective, and I too am a landlord with some small units, is that we have a humanitarian crisis in this state that has gone unaddressed for too long. And while I am new to the Capitol, I believe that the road of amendments uh, brings up the possibility that we could adjourn on June 30th once again without taking the necessary uh, action to provide relief to hundreds of thousands of Oregonians who are suffering. I, I very much agree with some of the testimony that we heard that this legislation does not get to the foundational cause of this problem, which does have to do with supply. I don't agree with folks who hold the belief that supply is the only thing that should be addressed, obviously, or I wouldn't be supporting this legislation. But this does not get upstream of the problem, this bill, and we need to do that. And we heard from the Senate President and a number of others that there's a commitment to take strong action with regard to supply. We have to do that. I'd, I'd say that there's another foundational cause that even goes deeper, which is how polarized wealth and income has become in this country. And we've seen this is our crisis is the result of 30 or 40 years of ex the cost of almost any everything going up except wages for so many people. That's a problem where we, we may not solve this legislative session, but there are causes that this doesn't get to. This is triage, but triage is absolutely necessary right now. Um, the, I would agree that there are flaws in this bill. I would be personally be open to examining them uh, revisions after we pass this legislation. But what's not acceptable to me is to uh, go through this legislative session without strongly uh, addressing the suffering that's going on in the state. And I think that this long negotiated uh, piece of legislation uh, is a good step in that direction. And I think we ought to uh, put a stake in the ground and pass this legislation as is. And then have an open mind to some of the concerns we heard from the landlord community, from the mobile home community here, uh, and think about revision. But um, I will take a, a pretty darn good bird in the hand over to theoretically perfect birds in the bush. I won't be supporting amendments. Thank you, Senator Golden. Any further discussion? Senator Gerard or Senator Cano proponing? Okay. Well, and I will just add, uh, in, in with respect to removing the emergency clause, for those of you that are following along, the, the very last provision of the bill says that it declares an emergency as an effective upon passage, meaning upon the governor's signature. And with all due respect to the concerns that have been raised, I don't believe that five senators who know where we are sleeping tonight and that it is safe and warm and dry and stable are in any position to tell hundreds of thousands of Oregonians without that security that their housing situation is not an emergency. So I strongly oppose the Dash 1 amendment for that reason. I'm going to be leaving. Well, uh, would that the clerk call the roll? Senator Golden. Um, may I hear the motion to restate, please? The motion to suspend, Madam Chair. For uh, clarification, there's still. No, we already, we already oh, passed the motion to right, suspend. Yeah. The motion to, to the motion, the motion is to. On the Dash 1 amendments. No. Senator Snow? Senator Montes Anderson? No. Vice Chair Gerard? Excuse. Chair Fagan? No. The motion fails. Mm -hmm. Is that the only one that was going to do that? Is that the only one? Is that the only one? Yep. Okay. Uh, Chair, I move Senate Bill uh, 608 to the floor with a due pass recommendation. 
Senator Monis Anderson moves Senate Bill 608 to the floor with a due pass recommendation. Is there any discussion? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Fagan. Uh, I, I think it's really unfortunate. I'm actually sad today because um, we're making policy that um, ultimately is going to be counterproductive to what all the proponents testified they actually want. And many people identified on what the biggest issue is. And uh, we heard that, I think, a week ago in this committee. And that's uh, the supply problem and lack thereof. And helping that supply market is what equalizes the imbalance between the supply and demand. And if you don't fix that, you won't fix the problem. In fact, in all likelihood, it's going to get worse. Uh, I'm a renter times two. I rent a house in Bend, and I rent an apartment here. And um, I understand what it means to be a renter. I've rented many times. I've also owned homes. Um, I think that very few people in this building have uh, done what I've done in terms of working on and helping develop and build affordable housing. And uh, I've worked in the space for the last 16 years now. And I can tell you that um, what's happening right now is going to cause people to get out of this industry. And um, it's already happening. I've been contacted by multiple people this week asking when this bill is going to pass. And apparently we're in a, a very big hurry to pass uh, this legislation because we're not going to have a fiscal or revenue impact, which uh, we normally do. But um, they're going to get out of this industry, which is going to mean less units, less supply with continuing demand equals higher rents. So I think it is unfortunate that we're not going to actually solve the problem and that we're likely to make it worse by this legislation. And I, that's really what makes me sad. And so um, it's clear that there aren't going to be any more amendments that are going to be uh, approved on this bill. And so, um, you know, the majority is going to move forward with uh, the legislation. And um, uh, I truly hope it works out. But I, um, I think economics and um, the facts say otherwise. Thank you. Further discussion? Madam Chair, I'd Senator like Goldman. to uh, agree with uh, Senator Canope's belief that if we don't take really serious measures towards increasing housing supply, we won't solve this problem. I look forward to working with him on that. Um, the best I can tell, given the shape of this agreement, which was a compromise where people at the table gave on various sides, I'm, I'm, I'll be supporting this legislation because I believe by a fairly wide margin it will do more good than harm to the hundreds of thousands of housing and secure Oregonians and look forward to working on the, on the supply problem. Thank you, Senator. Senator Sanderson. And regarding the supply problem, we do have an undersupply of housing. But as was stated, and as we have learned, the new rental housing is built for the higher income uh, tenants who are able to pay the rents high enough to cover the construction costs. So um, that is why we, uh, as an entity or the legislature, have to look at, yes, we have supply, but just remembering that those that are going into construction right now are covering, uh, they are building um, housing units for the higher income uh, tenants. Further discussion? In closing, I will just add that I, I share the concerns of many people that we heard today that I wish this bill did more and would, I would be willing to go further. Uh, to quote kind of the Street Roots editorial this week, this bill is the least we can do, and I believe that's right. But a year ago, December, when I was out 
canvassing, I met a, an 83-year-old woman who had been living in the dark for three months because her overhead lights had gone out. But she was so afraid of a no-cause eviction or a dramatic rent spike that she wouldn't ask maintenance to fix her lights. So it was December when I met her, and she'd been living in the dark for three months, and she said that if the rain wasn't too heavy, she could maybe read her newspaper by the light of the court courtyard lights that would stream in through her front window. And she was long cynical of politics and politicians, but she mustered up just enough faith to ask me to help her, and I told her that I would. And so despite the fact that this legislation is also not perfect for me, I, I will help her, and I will strongly support Senate Bill 608. Further discussion? Yes, one, one more thing, Madam Chair. We heard from several people today that there are some uh, really good public-spirited, uh, humane landlords in this state. And I, I know that to be true. I think some have been in this room today. I'm going to assume uh, Senator Monis Anderson is one of them. I'm, I'm going to claim to be one of them <laughs> myself. Um, and really, this, this, I believe the problems we're facing today have been created by a very small percentage of landlords in this state. And I, I tend to think that they I'm guessing that they tend to be more um, large corporate property owners who maybe don't live in the state. Um, uh, but we, um, we haven't found a way to word the bill that says we like to restrain greedy uh, landlords, but not the majority of public spirited, compassionate landlords. And, uh, you know, I am hoping that internally the um, community of landlords in the state find some way, I don't think uh, self-policing is quite the right word, but I would, you know, I'd love an alliance to find ways to, uh, to, to deal with those who profiteer and are really causing a lot of suffering and, and, and lighten up and protect the rights of landlords who are providing an important public service, making a profit because it's a business, but not profiteering because that's, I think that's the majority that we're working with here. Thank you. Further discussion? Okay, seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. Senator Bolden? Uh, pardon me, I, I want to yes. make sure with the number of motions, could we have a receipt? Speak the underlying the motion. motion. Yes. Uh, this is on the, the Senator Monis Anderson moved Senate Bill 608 to the floor with a due pass recommendation. Thank you. Senator Bolden? Yes. Senator Knope? No. Senator Monis Anderson? Aye. Vice Director Gerard? Excused. Chair Fagan? Yes. The chair passes, and uh, as previously discussed, I will co-carry the bill with my good senator or friend, Senator Lori Motus Anderson. Well, thank you, to everyone, for respecting the time limits and for staying and being patient. I really appreciate that. So, if there's anything else for the good of the order, I will adjourn the Senate Housing Committee.